good evening. Thank you for coming. We're going to start the meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. All rise. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do the final action before I, I approve the agenda? Uh, yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. It, approving the agenda is fine before that. Fine. Okay. Any emergency modifications to the agenda? No. Any, uh, I'll ask for a motion to approve the agenda for this evening. I move to approve the agenda for this evening. <laughs> All second. Oh. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 None Aye. opposed. Approval of the minutes from the April 18th meeting. Do I have a motion? I'll move to approve. Second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. None opposed. One abstention. Okay. And we don't have a student report tonight. Jennifer is working. She has an after-school job, so we'll miss her this evening. Um, I think now maybe Which we Which she does the... very well. I always see her working. I do too. Yeah, at Vons. Yeah, okay. she's great. So she does a great job. Maybe she's back. Yes, so we need to go back to, we did have a closed session concerning a student issue. We did. Uh, the, the board, uh, as you can see from the terminology as of the uh, distribution of the agenda last Friday, uh, was uh, set to have a full hearing uh, deliberation regarding uh, recommendation from me uh, for a student expulsion. Uh, between Friday and today, I uh, had some very good conversation with the parents of this student uh, who I think with, uh, with great commitment to their child and to the school district uh, agreed to sign a waiver of the expulsion hearing at a, and a settlement agreement. So uh, what I'm asking the board to do now is to approve that waiver of expulsion hearing and settlement agreement. Uh, the board's aware of all the issues that flow from that um, and the separation of the, uh, the student from the school district as a result. So that's my recommendation that the board approve the uh, expulsion hearing waiver and settlement agreement. Is there a motion to approve that? I'll move. All those in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Okay. So back to here at public comments. I don't believe we had anyone turn in anything for this evening so we'll move on to our special presentation 6.1 we have three issues tonight concerning Nordoff which we're very excited to hear about um, Greg are you going to be starting or are we gonna how, I will introduce uh, uh, Natalie I will introduce Natalie okay are we ready to go I think we are. Now, you thanks gonna, for having us. Do you want to do, you want to do one at a time, or do you want to give us sort of an overview? Sure, first? I give you an overview. Yeah. Um, we will. There's many issues on the agenda tonight related to Nordoff. Uh, the two connecting our science curriculum. We'll start there, and I'll introduce Natalie, who will do the heavy lifting for that presentation the first ten minutes. And from there, we will move to just an update on our uh, recommendation regarding an independent study PE agreement with Cedars Rowing, and we will move on to discuss sort of uh, the status report on our online independent study coursework offerings at Nordoff High School, and then we will close with, uh, again, just an update or discussion on UC, CSU, A to G um, issues. So let's dive into the science, and uh, let me introduce Natalie. And he, I wrote uh, something that I uh, hope you all get a chance to read by way of introduction, Natalie. Natalie is truly a very special science leader and really at a critical time. So this is the, um, as I think you'll see, the biggest science curriculum change in more than a generation that's taking place. And so to have somebody like Natalie with us to guide the department, um, we're just very, very fortunate. So um, Natalie, yeah. the floor is yours. I will be your PowerPoint okay. guide. I'm keep it short. Um, so I'm just going to um, so we are asking if, uh, for your approval to make our main freshman physics or freshman course physics and sciences, and then Greg will say more about our uh, request for science. So 
this is the course sequence that we would then be uh, having most of our students go through, physics, then biology, then chemistry, so biology in the sophomore year and chemistry in the junior year is how it is right now. So it would be taking what is currently our geoscience course um, and changing it to physics. Um, the, the, so that argument for physics first, so my understanding is I think a lot of the heavy lifting on the argument and where people stand on this sounds like it's happened already. It's an old idea that we have new reasons to talk about it for. Um, one of the main ones being the shift to the next generation science standards. So we'll say a little bit about that. But then there's also two other reasons that are specific to our situation at NORDOP, which is what is currently going on um, with our freshman physics courses and um, just our staffing who, who we are working with as a department. So we want, we want to see really three things um, connected to those big ideas. We have two classes. Um, one of them is an old familiar course that prior to me even teaching here was, uh, I guess, the freshman physics freshman course which incorporated physics and it's the lab physical science course which is now honors laboratory physical science and I taught that class in my first two years here. Um, I, I love that course. I think it does set up students well to approach biology and physics and chemistry um, but only 30 of our students are getting that instruction right now and um, the majority of our freshman class is in geoscience where the physics is not the focus so is that um, because it was an honors class yeah yes um, and then um, our NGSS standards are emphasizing conceptual understanding which is important to kind of why this is a good fit as a freshman course um, as our fundamental science course really the one where we start all of those routines and how how we approach science skills um, as our first course that we offer and then uh, which Greg will say a little bit more about later, um, how this would affect our department collaboration and thus um, support student success. Um, so I've said a couple things about this, but this is a visual. So we have laboratory physical science honors and all of those students go into biology. Um, meanwhile, that means then they're divided up into multiple sections where they previously were in one single section together. So it takes students and puts them um, more advanced in the physics simply by being exposed to it. And then it makes them a minority in a class with uh, students that haven't had that, that physics focused or chemistry focused or real good foundation of science support. Um, and so we want to make it more similar by offering physics in that geoscience section right there. So I think the, the, the key thing there is that physics is more similar to lab physical science than geoscience is. Exactly. Um, yeah, because otherwise the next time any student would see physics or for the first time any student from geoscience would see physics would be in their 12th grade year and that again is only a single period class which tends to be primarily students that took lab physical anyway. So that is why I brought these. Um, our department took all of the standards and we divvied them out into our existing sections um, and the, the standards that had no home in our main, main three courses were physics standards. Um, so this is just, then I'm gonna push into the NDSS that addresses our requests for why this is important to our students and what we're offering them. Um, then the new conversation, why talk about putting physics first now wrapped up in the standards. So this is how the standards are organized. There's this whole section on engineering and technology standards. They are supposed to be embedded in all years. There are only four of them, um, but you need to hit on them, or we aim to hit on them in every year. But physics being very visible, being very hands-on, so the theory of all of that that I can say more or less about um, with some later slides or at all, is um, that it it fits best with physics to um, approach engineering things. You build some machines, you can see it and, in action. And isn't, would you agree that that's the probably the, the in the new standards, that's what's most different is the inclusion of engineering and technology standards. Um, I think that's a huge component. I think the, 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 that right next to the fact that instead of being written as students know and assuming that we know how 
then students are going to demonstrate their knowledge. Um, these standards get more detailed into how students might be able to demonstrate their understanding, and it's really getting to more hands-on building things um, as well as modeling things, etc. So, would you, would you say that's kind of related to Common Core-ish kind of ideas? Yeah. yeah. You know, NGSS are often described as just the Common Coreification of science. It's, it's just the Common Core expression of science. Yeah, so then when we look at these four different sections of the sciences, I mean the life sciences, earth and space sciences, and physical sciences, which actually consists of chemistry and physics standards. We split up those physical science standards and we make physics its own course. Um, then we would be integrating the geoscience into all three years. Um, and that's our plan. It's coming from the models that the framework for teaching the NGSS science standards offers or suggests. So they technically have four models that they present in the framework. The fourth one being a four-year model, which is just not, we can't offer that. Um, it, it's kind of what we have right now with geoscience first and AP physics last, but AP is not an, it's not expected to fall into the NGSS standards. So we need to um, break it in three years, so we're mixing up models two and three. Wait, you can slow down a little bit. Okay. It's going a little fast for me. <laughs> yeah, okay. so the fourth model that I've not included, I just think it's important for you guys to know that we looked at that. Um, and by no stretch does it have to be a perfect following of any model, but it requires four years of science which would be to do earth science one year, biology one year, chemistry one year, and physics one year. Um, and so because they know, the, the people who wrote the framework, that most schools can't, don't even off, require three years right now. They have these three different models for three years. We're not going to do integrated. Um, it would be like a total undoing of what exists for the sake of undoing it, I think. So we are looking at what works already and what we have. Our biology course is good. It fits well with what we have in anatomy and physiology. So one of the main requests from the department is let's not move bio later because students need to take A&P in their junior year. If they haven't had bio, A&P is not much harder. That's anatomy and physiology. So we're going to leave bio, which means we're not doing, if you were doing research on this old discussion, it was physics and then chemistry and then bio was the argument when this initially all came up, I don't know, back in the 70s, I think. Um, but uh, we're going to leave biology. I'm Sorry, this to is, uh, he's, okay. back, he's trying. Oh, I see what's going on. OK. <laughs> but, um, I think what you have in front of you is correct. Natalie, <laughs> Natalie, you only gave him one thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> one with many different parts. <laughs> Um, Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Don't we offer we offer a AP Psych course? We do. We have. And an isn't AP that a science or no? So we put it's a social that social as social, social science. science. Okay. So it doesn't it doesn't necessarily require the hard science background to be in. So Natalie, up on, on slide number eight, when you yes. have, you have both both within the oval, right? You know, both yes. within the okay. So just take explain. The, in the next four years or so, what's going to happen in that old? Who's, what, what will be the program four years out? So, I I do think that feeds into. So I'm just saying we're taking from model two, the fact that we want to put our physical, our major physical science course at the in the first year, and then we are taking from model three the fact that we are breaking it into those three main headings: biology, chemistry, physics just in a different order. So we're shifting physics to the end, which I'm arguing we're taking from model two. And then we're integrating the earth sciences. Um, and so how do we imagine the shift to that in the next few years? Um, so putting physics first is in part with the shift to the NGSS, uh, an issue of staffing. Um, and the issue might not be the best word. I think it's like capitalizing on our staff that is most excited about the NGSS. And so to set, um, and, and it is going to stay, uh, not retiring in other words. So, um, so to put that first, because a lot of it is just a method of approach that is changing, not that you have to know how to calculate the acceleration, speed, position of something. 
before you have to go talk about molecules necessarily. Um, they can feed into each other, but it's more that physics is visible. You can approach it in this way that we're wanting to shift our instructional approach to be more engaging, hands-on, engineering-based. Um, it just transfers more easily, and so that's why that would be first. And we would hope to see those skills um, build up in these other classes later. Um, and that gets into the theory of it. Um, I think I've hit on those three main things, which is just our students need to uh, have more of an equal access to physics and science skills in their first year. Um, and then the NGSS standards are shifting what we are focusing on instructionally, um, not just in terms of content. In fact, less so in terms of content and more so in terms of uh, expectation of performance and approach to just learning the concepts in general. And then that our staff, it fits well to put the physics um, first with who's sticking around. Um, and this becomes very theoretical into why physics fits well uh, as a first in terms of the content. So the biggest argument against, against it is math and students' experience with math. So a couple of things about that. Um, we have talked as a department, those who want to and will be teaching the physics course um, and those who won't, that one of the biggest things is grasp reading and and not just like you can plot a point but you can use it to make an argument and you can use it to make an understanding and so it's mathematical but it's learning to use it as a tool instead of relying on it and so when I think about this physics first course yes the word conceptual comes out and it makes people feel safe but I think that a, 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 a more descriptive way of saying that it's a conceptual is to look at the math not as something that is, it's not a prerequisite. You don't need to know how to manipulate an algebraic equation to be successful. You're going to come in, you're going to look at the phenomena, you're going to collect data, the common core things, what are the patterns showing us, and the patterns turn into graphs, and the graphs turn into these algebraic equations. And as the year goes, we'll progress more into that. So the math is still there, but it, it's not something that we're relying on. It's something that we're using the physics, actually, to access um, a, a better understanding of. I think it's actually, you know, when you think about it, it makes sense that way. And so therefore, the math becomes less frightening. Because it's Hopefully. like, oh, you know, people don't go, oh, graphs. Right? They're thinking right. scientifically information. They're thinking information-wise. And then the next time they see graphs in math, it has less That's what we want. weight. Well, and you, can't, you can't get to step two in physics the old way. Mm -hmm. If you didn't understand the math, you couldn't get to step two. You couldn't get into physics. You just had to be able to do the math to do the physics. Exactly. Now you're saying the, the math is a natural evolution or the mathematical endpoint. Call it the graph. Yeah, There's it a is natural evolution science. of all the other stuff that we see there, right? Yeah. You know, and I, I would also add that Natalie is practicing what she preaches. This is uh, the first year in many years that we have a physics P course that's being taught for seniors, seniors that didn't want to take AP because of the math, a very intensive uh, math requirement. But she's teaching conceptual physics to seniors that might have uh, weak mathematical skills. So she's already sort of piloted this. Um, yeah, and, and um, it's, it's a different, so like I said with the foundation, it's a different approach to everything. So if students are used to coming in and getting notes, then sometimes you're up against, well, I, they are expecting notes right now, but the notes would beg algebraic expressions and so on and so forth. So putting it instead of at the end of their high school career, where a lot of the habits of learning have been set, putting it at the beginning, saying, this is how we do this. We do a phenomena. They would observe something like you're seeing at the bottom here, which is that little pieces of paper are being picked up by a charged balloon, which you maybe made your hair stand on in. And then the, the, the task is to get at a model that explains this. And so they are, with solely the phenomena to begin with, trying to draw a picture that 
has a built-in explanation for why that's happening, um, and then getting into the maths and the graphs of that. So this is just kind of a goal of what we would have. I know there's more. Uh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> we can keep it. We have, we have charts. We, yeah, no, we, we don't have to do that. Yeah, I would love to talk about those, but no. Um, I, I just think we oh, are getting ahead. into this the This is our next page. Big thing. Sure. <laughs> resources, resources, there. Um, no, no, before that. Modeling one instruction. Foot. There you go. Yeah. No, one more. No, one more. 14. Modeling yeah. instruction. There you go. 14. Yeah, so from a more kind of logistical spec uh, perspective, what are the costs of, of making a shift like this? And so I wanted to emphasize in these final slides with resources that really we actually have access to a lot online. And it's probably better to pull from mul multiple sources than to try to buy a whole new textbook. So we're not asking um, to, to have a new text adoption for this. Um, these are some examples of sources I would pull from that are getting into some of the details of that we've been talking about a little bit here, really, of, of approach to, to uh, teaching science. Um, the, the theory, the pedagogy, and all of that. So Pogel is a big one, um, which is actually currently being used a little bit in our chemistry classes. Um, yeah. yeah, wait. OK, so I'll start with this one. Uh, physics and Everyday Thinking uh, is a online, um, it's actually used at undergraduate facilities. Um, it was originally designed for high school and then got pushed up to undergraduate, but they still have great resources for ideas. Um, some visuals here of what a classroom would look like that is approaching physics in the way that I was describing with the phenomena first and um, the graphing equations and other things later after lots of trial and error and classroom discussion. Um, so next slide is the POGO resource that I mentioned. It's currently being used in chemistry. Um, and those are just kind of interactive questions that guide students through the process of thinking to understand instead of being given answers and equations to memorize. Um, that is something we can draw resource to. Some of this does cost, but not all of it. Um, next slide. Wait, where did my modeling instruction one go? Is that out of order? Sorry. And there's another one. So another online resource um, that I actually have downloaded all onto a flash drive. And this is what I have primarily used um, this year in my physics e course as, as a resource. So if there are questions on the resources what, what, at all. Yeah, what does all that mean? All of those <laughs> the, left, the upper left hand sort of side. So the, the left hand. What is all that? What are all those arrows? What so that that's kind of what it's. It's a. Is that general enough question? Map of what I was trying to describe, where they they are exploring. The, oh. Yeah, I mean, you can kind of start. Yeah, you, you kind of have to start at the exploration. Mm -hmm. Pick a paper with a balloon, and then they are in groups trying to describe what's going on. And then when everybody puts up their poster, if everybody has a similar thing, I mean, the teacher's job is to help point out, look, you all did this. That's kind of that discovery point that um, can push us back into more exploration to draw a graph this time, right, as we have this pattern. Um, so that outside is describing the actual process. Meanwhile, you are developing models, which is it, it's a lengthy discussion of what, I mean, teachers, I sat around the table with teachers and science teachers and we're all trying to say what a model is. And if I go back to the um, balloon slide, right there, that would be a model up in the top left. So it's a diagram that we can use to explain a phenomenon, um, something that's happening. And we want our students to be really good at that. We don't want it to feel foreign. Um, so. That's what that diagram is describing. It's, it's theoretical. Yeah. That's what we're going for. Is Carplus like a theoretician that talks about the learning cycle? Yep. The, those names Carplus and Wells and Hess. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Nice going there. I, I worked it out with her before. You're not just, you're not just a lawyer. <laughs> Do it, so does Common Core not require much math uh, with respect to physics? Yeah, so I, I, I pulled these. So 
Here's an example of a standard. They're lengthy. But at the bottom, it says assessment boundary. And I, pulled, I brought them specifically for this question. Many of them, um, and this is a chemistry standard, but many of them say, and there is debate against this, but assessment does not include calculating the total bond energy. So they're, they're taking out a lot of the calculations um, in those physical science standards. And it's not all of them, um, but it's just an example that they're emphasizing more of the conceptual. I mean, I don't know much about this personally, yeah. but my son is graduating in two months with a degree in physics. Yeah. And sometimes I ask him a question and I, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> well, that's exciting. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, as long as it's not required, it seems like if you can get excited about these concepts, yes. then it can support you in further learning. Exactly. Where if you get scared, then it's not. Absolutely. So it's very so much applied physics too. rather than theoretical. Mm -hmm. or and we want them to be excited about physics. I mean, we want students to be excited about learning and coming to school. And so if that will do it, that would be awesome. Well, and there is, there's lots of research that shows when students have something that that interests them, that they apply themselves more to the math or to the things that, that weren't as important to them. But if they, you know, especially physics, I know that there's a lot of kids that really get excited about physics. Yeah. They didn't realize, you know, that's the fun math. Yeah, they've you know, been so. doing it their whole lives. Right. There is psychology evidence that babies understand this physics concepts just naturally because you're observing your world. I mean, they're not calling it gravity, but they know. <laughs> <laughs> so just to be clear, though, all the geoscience concepts are being put into the physics, biology, and chemistry course. Yes, and so that's into everything. The most affected by that will be our physical sciences, chemistry, and physics. Biology is the, the most standards exist for biology, so there are a couple things we're going to fit in there. And then the other part of that is we were really excited about the environmental science, but we're... That, that still exists. That still exists. There's no change in that. That's still a CT pathway we have, so if you go back yeah, to... Go back. This slide here, we you can now. see environmental science is still a choice for freshmen. And then CTE, environmental science or environmental field studies, is sort of the capstone of that pathway. So it's, it's still an option for those students who really want to pursue that sort of field studies kind of work. So they're missing out on the physics course. They are missing out on the physics, but again, that's a pathway, and pathways do take you on well, a specific path and not a path. So is it required that you continue on that pathway? It's not just a one-off class, the environmental No, science? it's not required. Uh, the, the ninth graders have the choice of those three courses, and they can, as you can see, they have very confusing arrows going everywhere. They can go anywhere. Uh, environmental science students can go into intrabio, intrabio or bio, and then from there, they can continue on the pathway and go back into environmental studies as juniors, or they can take chemistry as juniors, and then they can take environmental CTE environmental science as seniors. I think the, hopefully the takeaway here is there's more flexibility, more pathways in transitioning from one place to another in science than anywhere else in our curriculum. Yeah. So and these, um, the CTE, with all CTEs, those are um, definitely fulfilling the science model or uh, requirement or they, we hope that they will. I'm so sorry, Jane. I was addressing a. Oh, I think that CTE welding and auto is the one that we were trying to look at to see if we can fit in the you know the science. But I think that one is more geared towards your three-year science requirement, less yeah. so connected to this. Oh, so we'll talk about that later. Yeah. So are these three ninth grade science? There's still a um, a G elective. So they're not going to fulfill a, um, the D. No, physics P will fulfill D. It will a, now. Yes, it will. Because the lab physical science. The lab didn't. physical. The lab phys physical could. We never had it. it, and technically it was never needed for the most part. All those. I don't want to say definitively, but I can say almost assuredly, all those students ended up in chemistry. So then chemistry fulfilled their physical D. So. We can have lab physical science and we can have physics fulfill the D requirement in UCA to G for. Three recommended? 
Three are strongly recommended, two are required. Right. Um, environmental science fulfills the G requirement. It does not fulfill the D lab science requirement. But biology would. Biology does fulfill the uh, life science D requirement. So in D, we're getting into the weeds here, but that's okay. In D, <laughs> there, you have to have one course of a life science lab and one course of a physical science lab. So environmental science is not a life science or a physical science lab, so, but it is a G elective. You see a G, it's a G elective, not a D lab. So in order to fulfill it, if you went into environmental science, you would have to do biology and chemistry. You could biology do, you is could not do biology lab. and chemistry, or you could I'm have sure. a student do biology and take physics. There's, there's no reason why, let's say that student is a junior and they haven't taken physics yet and they want to take physics B, and the majority of the students are freshmen, they can still take it. There's no grade level restriction. Does that make sense? Do you see a drop in the environmental science class if you offer a D instead of a G science? Um, you know, I was talking with Brother Pine about that, and I, I don't think so because those students who are really interested in being A to G were already taking three years of science, and because it took three years of science at NORDOP to become A to G, because that first year was a G, right? So you took uh, biology your second year and chemistry your third year. For those students that are want to take environmental science, same, the same thing. They're, if, if they're interested, they can still easily be A to G. They can just take environmental science and chemistry. So and those kids would look very similar to how our kids in the old system look. They would be taking three years, only they would take chemistry, which would fulfill their physical lab science their third year. So, um, you know, I don't know. I don't think so. Lab, uh, environmental science, usually we sometimes have to turn some kids away because it's such a popular pathway. I, so I don't predict a major drop. Okay. Do you see moving it to not being offered as a freshman course? Which one? The environmental the science? Environmental science. Okay. It can be, well, environmental science, so first of all, in order to have a pathway, you have to have a CTE pathway, you have to have a minimum of two recommended three levels. So, or any pathway, let's say, uh, maybe something you'd be more familiar would be auto. So intro to auto, common freshman class, and then there's ROP or CTE, automotive tech, so that would be the capstone class. So uh, um, there's two levels there. Ideally, you want to have a pathway, have three levels like you would in Health Science Academy. Anatomy, medical terminology, anatomy, physiology, and then environmental, or excuse me, uh, emergency first responder. So you have to have, um, at the minimum of two levels, and so that freshman class, environmental science, is the introductory course to the advanced CTE environmental science. A student could easily take it their sophomore year if they took physics, but they would need to go back and take a life science uh, lab D course if they wanted to be a G. So there's, I have all those grade levels up at the top, but there, there is no reason why students can't take those courses in, in different grade levels. So we're, and we're talking about physics, intro bio, physics, biochemistry as the typical pathway, the typical sequence, not the required sequence. So if you, let's say you didn't take um, the freshman auto thing, you took physics and then you took biology, <coughs> and then you were like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna go to college. Could you take the CTE welding, or do you have to take the freshman welding? Um, do you, so is the, are you asking, is the introductory, introduction to auto required to take automotive technology? No, I don't think it is, but if you want to have a CTE certificate, I believe it is. So that's, the CTE certificates or the old ROP certificates mean that you went through this pathway and that you are certified as being um, approved by that pathway. But no, there's no requirement in the automotive pathway. Do some, I'm trying to figure out my own son's situation. Have you been in biology as a freshman? Was he in biology as a freshman? Mock. Mr. Mock. No, he was in lab physical science. That's lab physical science. Okay. 
Yeah. Lab, lab he's taking cool. chemistry now, but I think that's because, because of some conflict. Yeah, he, uh, he's the one exception that we have because of a master degree. Yeah. Right. No, there's three. Three. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 And do we, beyond AP physics, we have no other physical science AP? No. no. Um, AP science. Yes. Well, the, we, the, right. Uh, uh, many years ago, we had AP chemistry when we were bigger. Um, I can't remember if there's anything else that we may have had. AP I think we have the AP bio. No, we've never had AP bio study. Not a whole section. And do they do any of our students pursue other, um, you know, AP classes off campus these days? AP classes off campus? Uh, no, not that I know. Of. I mean, what is? What happens occasionally is that a student will be very interested in a very specific kind of science, say marine biology, and they want to take marine biology at um, Ventura College, something like that, we say, great, that's not a course we offer on campus, so we uh, encourage that. I had a student this year who independent studied for the environmental IP class. Oh, yeah, that's right. And that's that's right, we haven't had that um, in a long time, so. Who's doing, how are they doing that? Who's organizing that for them? She bought a study book, and she was enrolled in the um, CTE course, and essentially used her teacher there as well as uh, Greg Pine, environmental science, the freshman year, kind of as mentors on the matter. But it was very independent. It's kind her. of independent study with meeting with Greg Pine on yeah. occasion, going through study work. Yeah. So it's just to take the test. It's not accredited class. It's just to take the test. Right? Just to take the test. Any questions? Any questions for us? Or Jane, would you mind? I, I thought Greg's introduction was so nice, and we do have people sometimes watching. Can I just read it? And I'll read it quickly. Yeah. Because it's, I think it goes to the, some of the great things we have going on at Nordoff. Natalie Hay is a fourth year science teacher trained and credentialed from the University of California, Santa Barbara. She's also Nordoff's science department chair. Natalie teaches AP physics, physics P, chemistry, and intro to chemistry, and has taught lab physical honors as well. Chosen by her peers as Nord Nordoff's Teacher of the Year for 2015-16, Natalie is the youngest, newest teacher to earn that reward. Natalie is a visionary science teacher who is passionate about science and students, passionate about the profession and the state of science education in general. Natalie will embark on a doctoral program in teaching and learning at the University of California, Santa Barbara, beginning next year. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, I want to know you only got to slide 16. <laughs> so uh, you had four left, right? I did. I did. I really feel like we talked about them, but let's like, do it really fast. fast. So for comparison, collaborative research. Maybe the last one. Okay. Uh, we well, yeah, we didn't mention that. So comparison, collaborative research. Keep going. Go. Go. That one there. So Santa Barbara uh, School District just recently voted actually to officially move. So they will be doing their main freshman courses physics as well. But that went through a pilot program at San Marcos High School um, using actually some of the same things that I had access to that modeling instruction work. Um, I haven't been out to see it, but uh, they were able to basically have no difference between their honors and regular course because they were approaching the math in that way. So other than pacing, um, they were using the same curriculum. And then touched on this, just uh, I really look at the course. I think when you brought up the just getting excited about science, that's the big thing. And then just the skills of approaching the science are built into that. And um, yes, we will use math ultimately, but it's not our crutch. All right, and then uh, I, I don't know if Greg's still going to chime in and say more, but we're looking at this is actually being a good move for collaboration as well. So less uh, singleton courses, more of us teaching the same thing. and really working together to transfer what the expectation is in approaching our science concepts from class to class to class, building ideally a strong foundation for that in physics where it's comfortable and accessible to approach the math through the phenomenon. You know, I, and, and maybe to look at it and wrap this up, I would say that uh, we feel very similarly. I'm not coming from an expert science instructional perspective, but knowing 
what NORDOF has done historically with science in the freshman year, I absolutely think this is the right call. It's going to be the best thing for students. And then when you couple it with the fact that we have really passionate and engaged people ready to do it, and our, our geoscience veterans are riding off into the sunset, uh, it's a great time to do it. And truthfully, any sequence that you can ideally construct that would be best for student learning is less important than do you have a great teacher in the room who's passionate about the subject who has expertise in that area. That's more important than the sequence, and that's that's what we have. That's what we have. So that's one of the reasons why we're doing this. But again, I think it's going to be far more accessible to equalize things for students across the performance spectrum. Uh, Natalie's leading the way. We're excited. Yeah. Great. Wait, just one more last statement about what's the impact on the master schedule? Right. So when you when create when you create the science sections and you think about the teachers, uh, I assume it's going to be much easier to put students into where they need to be. Yes, uh, we are eliminating one singleton and um, I don't want to, <laughs> this is like another 30 page of no, okay. master schedule. But, uh, um, so singletons are classes that happen only once a day and if a student needs that class, um, you've got to get them there, and we have a lot of singletons in the row off schedule because we're so small, so that means the two singletons that are lined up in the same period the student has to choose. Those are forced choice uh, master scheduling companies, right? So the, the fewer singletons you have, far better for master scheduling. Sometimes better for students, but not necessarily if you're eliminating singletons at the expense of choices and flexibility and just cramming all kids into these general classes. So it's, it's a trade-off, it's a balance. But this will get us, this will, be a reduction in the number of singletons, not a huge reduction, but more so it will reduce some of the isolation that happens in science. Science becomes so isolating. For example, she's the only chemistry teacher. She can't collaborate with anyone. And she's excellent at doing chemistry instruction, but you lose a lot of instructional mojo when you can't bounce ideas off and, and plan together. Uh, and so teaching physics will bring in at least two or three other people mm -hmm. they'll be able to. And then some of the chemistry will transfer. It'll be the first year that I have people to collaborate in every subject. And then it, it opens up on the other end as well, the same thing. So yeah. that's where a lot of the enthusiasm is coming from too, actually. So Just yes, a little bit. Plan together. Great. Yeah, more so that. yeah. Well, if I can add one last thing. I don't think it's been mentioned is the connection here to this conceptual physics class to STEM. And you know, I think this is getting us closer to um, introducing STEM uh, as well as you know the fact that engineering uh, jobs are very high in demand, they're very lucrative, and we think that maybe an early experience rather than waiting for their senior year that might get more students interested in thinking about uh, careers in the STEM field. And also, you know, Natalie has also contributed to an idea to our new library renovation. It's a maker space, so you know, we, we feel like this could have just additional benefits beyond what we've been seeing here. Corey, another round of applause. Thank you. Great. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Students that want, need, 
and thrive on that analytical, and that's where AP Quickers is still there. It's still there, and those kids will still get that class. Um, so yeah, that's where we right. should stop focused on. Like, Okay. Thank you. On to, uh, I don't think I need to touch too much more on the three-year graduation science requirement recommendation. Again, that's returning to a three-year requirement uh, that we uh, have stepped away from, or that we chose to step away from in about uh, memory serves 2010 or 2011 because of uh, financial constraints. But the truth is the, the majority of our students take three or more years of science already in the in this current environment where they're not required to. And if we can um, shift a little bit, it doesn't have to be a lot, but shift a little bit of the uh, CTE auto and welding to focus more on some of the science elements of it, gases, energy, electricity, all the things that, um, all the science topics that you can do in auto and in welding, that's an option for fulfilling the three-year science requirement for those students. So all told, if we look over the past three years, again, only a, about 12 to 15 students would not have had three years of science in the last three years if, if we had a three-year science requirement and included uh, welding and So we're talking about a very- Per year number. or total? I'm sorry? 12 students total or? 12 students, no, per year. Per year. 12 students per year. So again, we're not talking about enough students to warrant an additional section, which would be an expense, of course. And we're not sort of uh, foisting this on a, a large group of students against their will. We're just uh, we're trying to be more expansive about what we call science, what is science, applied science. The same thing that UCA and G is doing. They're they're trying to expand their offerings, their stamp on more CTE offerings. So we feel like we're, what we're doing is in line with that. I do I do feel like it's a little against sort of what the CTE is trying to accomplish. Right, which is these pathways, and it's sort of like requiring another science for someone who's choosing a pathway that's different from the four-year university. Is I think I think we do have a, you know, that concerns me. I mean, I know we're not voting on anything tonight, but that's in my head that I would want to be thinking about and looking at is those students who, you know, because you're it's not like you need to decide as a freshman, you know, if you're doing freshman physics and then you're doing your biology, and then you can say, hey, I, I. Now I'm at a point where certainly by the end of your sophomore year, you're kind of thinking, what do I want to go to two year? Do I want to go to four year? Do I not want to go to college at all? And I think I think requiring the third year science is I'm I'd worry about losing students from graduating. But that's where the auto welding can come in, and and with that, one of the things that I keep thinking about is we hold these college fairs. Or colleges come in and, and you know kids can kind of shop around but we have um, a lot of unions that do welding and auto and HVAC and these kinds of things and if we had uh, that have um, components where the where graduating high school students can go in and become interns and uh, or not interns they have um, trade the like apprentice. apprenticeships yeah. and to know that that's an option as you're in those classes, if we had some kind of an apprenticeship there also, I think it would strengthen those kids who may see it as this third year as being difficult, uh, you know, adding the third year of science. I think if we shore it up that way, it would be a benefit to those kids. You know, Greg, there's, actually, there's a lot of merit there because <clears throat> if, you, if you're talking about um, you know, less than 10% of the class. Uh, and your, your point is to move them into more, let's call it science education with the broadest definition of science. It's an internal decision. It's not something that someone is telling you to do. So if you have 12 to 15 students in a class, and when, the, when that student parents sit down with a counselor, the best path for that student is not to position him or her into one of these standard science classes. You can always create some other pathway. Right? So if the student has two years, as Jane was describing, if you have two years of X and you want to do the kind of thing that Shelley's talking about, all you have to do is just sign off. Right? Just sign off, say, okay, that counts. Right? Uh, now, the, the only other question you have to answer is not today, but what, what would the student be taking instead of 
that what we're now calling a third year of science. What, what would the likely choice be for those 15 students? Well, uh, so in other words, what, what courses are not going to get those registrations? Um, open off campus. Huh? Uh, off campus. Jobs. Oh, no. not in class. Not in oh, class. That's what so you're <laughs> we, yeah. when I so that could be a good thing. For the longest time, up until about 2010, 11 again, this is um, uh, financially driven, allowing students to take a uh, five period day or seniors, and in certain cases, a four period day. Right. So if they had a job or they're taking a, a BC course, so some of those scenarios might be decreased, um, but they're. I don't know, Dave, any other thoughts about what classes would they not be taking? Again, we're talking about so few. Right, exactly. So few. So right, but. 15, so what right. are those students taking? Yeah, they may not be in uh, ceramics, ceramics for the third class, time. some arts, uh, right. you know, any of the other video productions, okay. uh, graphic design. But, so, but not for the, I wouldn't say for the first time. There's plenty of opportunities still yeah. throughout the years for those students to take those courses. A lot of those students are taking it the second or third time. But the point is, you could waive in the counselor's office working with Dave. You could waive that third year requirement if there's a reason that that student needs. Right, to if it's an else. internal yeah, whatever district yeah. requirement, that could be waived. Okay, that's my point. It isn't. There's no. The, the, you can create what's best for that student, still moving the school in the general direction of having more science and a more open definition of science. But in the counselor's office, all you have to do is just say, doesn't fit this kid. Okay. Because it's beyond the California state minimum for graduation. So if a district adopts uh, a beyond the California minimum requirement for graduation, the district can offer a, a waiver or an exception. Always. Oh. Yeah. Huh. I also have to say, I think we're, we're competing against so many Sorry. private schools in this valley. And the perception of quality yep. uh, and the notion of teaching science it's so intertwined that I think it's only going to help us compete against all these private schools. Yeah. And if we're really talking about uh, UC Energy, is a whole other conversation. Again, would you? Would you will be? What's that? <laughs> yeah, soon. Yeah, maybe soon. Yeah. So maybe I'll save it for that. But but you're right. I I feel like this is the right nudge. It's not a giant leap. It's the right nudge. It's the right. Step. Okay, let's uh, move on. We wanted to update you, and for the next topics, um, to see this rowing update. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Anna. Uh, thank you. Online independent um, study coursework, and then the uh, UC CSU AG, which we'll end with. Um, Dave will, will help me out with those. But um, let's start with uh, independent study students here with UC rowing. And, we wanted to take a look at this, and I gotta give Shelly uh, a lot of credit for prompting us. This was something, as you know, we changed our PE policy pretty significantly this year to include students who take, um, who participate in sports that exempts them from having to take a mandatory freshman PE period. So that, that opens up their schedule. So that was one step on the road of PE flexibility that we want to take. and. Um, and so Shelley uh, prompted us to look at that perhaps sooner than we would have without the prompting, but it was the right call. It was the, it was the right call. So, and as, as Hank has said, you know, um, it doesn't matter if it comes from a board member or happens to be a parent. If it's the, if it's a great idea, if it's the right decision, uh, look at it. We did. So, um, thank you, Shelley, for that. So we uh, initiated some conversations with Wendy from Casitas Rowing. Excellent conversation with our uh, with Jim Hall, who you know is our dean, also the chair of the PE department. And uh, Renee, who's our athletic uh, director, we met with her, did some research. Yeah, we researched uh, several other school districts, Santa Barbara, uh, Santa Monica, and um, also specifically talked to Foothill down in Ventura. You know, they run an independent study PD program that's um, even beyond just with Casillas Rowing. They have a lot of other, um, you know, gymnasiums and things of that nature that they do. So we. You know, relied on what was already out there instead of trying to reinvent the wheel. We just simply took some great ideas that are out there and tried to create one that's going to take the value. So I think what was compelling for us is that we obviously do not offer uh, a rowing, uh, unless our pool revision might include a rowing land. I, I don't know if that's still in the books, but we don't offer rowing. 
And so a lot of our, and it's, and, it's, and it's very local, we have a lot of our students engaged in that, and it requires a lot of time, a lot of time. So it, it's not really uh, feasible for a student to do that, in addition to do to being involved in a lot of other Nordoff sports. So, uh, and we know a lot of our students uh, engage in that full time. We, I remember we had a student a couple of years ago who got a scholarship uh, from the Joe Rowe at college. So it's the right step for us because it's a group that represents support that we don't offer at Nordoff and they've been, they've been great to work with. So we just thought we'd check in with you on that, see if there are any questions that you had about that plan to pilot the program and then to take a look at the end of the year, next year, to see how it affected sports enrollment, our ability to offer sports. Uh, you know, students still have to take the California physical fitness test. I'm assuming the oldest kids are gonna pass in great shape. I think it's a great step in the right direction. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think the point, and I think you made absolutely the right call in my uh, kids who are doing sports, they're getting more than they would have gotten out of the PE class. And whether they're doing those sports on campus or off campus, the important thing is that they're physically fit and they're learning about sports. And uh, I, I think a lot of good things can come from it. And I think there are more opportunities for that in the future. That's a great, great step. I'm going to throw one out there because it's, I, I think it's percolating it's on the subject generally, which is there's obviously a difference between somebody taking a sport for the credit when they need it to graduate, which, as I understand, it's only a freshman requirement. Uh, but, well, no, you need two years. We got two years. Two years. Um, it just feels like it's it's so hard for you know obviously I have a lot of personal experience but there's a lot of pull in, yeah. you know from from various factions of um, the extracurriculars at Nordoff and it seems like it would be great if someone if the, if the if the people who are coaching sports perceive that they're in a box because they're having to offer this for some um, credit that kids who don't need the credit should be able to just say, I don't want the credit. Let me just play the sport. So I don't, you know, because it's it can get it's gonna be just overwhelming, you know, being if you miss three days of practice because you're, you know, sick or something else and yeah. suddenly you gotta make up three days. You gotta be at the school at five o'clock in the morning, you know, it's like right. you, you just can't do it all. And then you're at this mercy of, of this kind of arbitrary process that may or may not um, give you a bad grade in a sport that you don't even you just want to do the sport. Yeah. Well, we also are discovering for our highest performing student athletes that it actually, you know, because they are taking you know, AP classes that are weighted, that taking a sport which is not weighted can right. actually have a negative impact on their overall GPA. We've had some really good discussions with students, and yet um, there is some logic and reason to definitely look at that and give them that option. I heard actually from someone, I don't know, uh, that, that you're someone's physically recalculating for the top 10 not to not to burden somebody who's who's being brought down by extracurricular grades oh okay so um, yeah so our, our calculation for our top seniors we're not recalculating for this group that we've already determined mm -hmm. there's no recalculation going on for that but in the future some kind of calculation See, right now, the, the way that we calculate it tries to account for exactly what you're saying, because we, we don't count sports. So, the, you know, those students who have sports and A's in those sports that actually lower their GPA, they, they aren't affected by our top senior calculation. So, again, there's a... a and I didn't mean to get into that. No, but that's really important. There's a lot of different yeah. ways to calculate GPA. So we calculated one way, UC's calculated another, CSU's calculated another, some private schools calculated a different way. We want to have it calculated to the better uh, to the you know the best interest of the student uh, and that might be the case where a lot of times athletics helps them sure right so um, if there's a way to click that button on for those students and click it off for others that that can be a little administratively challenging but it, it can be done yeah. hopefully it can be done david rogers should be david to talk about that's right uh, well you know it didn't sound like this is what you were talking about exactly, but it should be noted, and it relates to a little bit of, of my response to Thane on this, and I'll get to in just a second, is that for students who want to play the sports but don't want to take it for credit, in which case they, they might not feel as compelled, or they, because they have other conflicts, they can't come to every practice, they have to understand that there are consequences that they might be able to start. They're not sure, playing. of course. Right, so that can create 
a challenging dynamic on a team sometimes where gosh, that kid's the best kid. You know, is that coach really aligned with our principles? He's going to play the team that practiced the most as opposed to the team that is the best because that kid's not coming to practice, but he's, you know, he's your star guy or whatever. Uh, that can create a little divisiveness on a team. And so you, you got to be careful of that. So that, does that not happen if they're taking it for credit? Well, we've not, we, we've not explored that. We have to think about that. We have to think about that. So can a, can a, can a coach, an off-campus coach, who we might not have as much communication with as we want, will they really understand who they have on their team? There's kids that might be in practice every day, and then there's some kids that might not because they're not taking for credit because they have some conflicts going off some other things. And what does that mean when it comes to playing time and who starts? That's, that's a layer of calculations that they would have to you know, that, that really is an interesting wing process. I hear what Kevin's saying, and I understand that there can be a lot of pressures on kids who uh, are, are passionate about two or more areas outside of class. But the description that you just gave about the coach having to, having to deal with that, that's not appealing to me. But, you know, I mean, that I thought you know, the, this is what I'm talking about. I mean, the, at the varsity level, I mean, kids are, I, I don't know, I look at somebody, it's like, okay, if they were on the choir trip and they missed their. Um, softball game and practice you know you're they they're going to be affected you know that doesn't make any sense to that's, me that's if a, they're just right. skipping because they're not into that's that into the softball issue. then they're that's the coach the is going to know right. that you don't have to right. i and, mean and high schools in particular are, they need you need to not put kids between two adults right that's that's what you really want to try to avoid so what you're talking about where you have a commitment right in music say and in sports and you know you pick one you should not potentially be penalized in the other because you have... But I think kids are being and They can be, and that's the tricky part. All I, what I was saying, though, is where it's a just, I'm not going to go to practice because right, I'd just rather not go to practice. And then the coach has to weigh that, you know, player versus player. As an, just a pure athletic environment, that does not, it's not appealing. Well, I, I, I want to be clear because I'm being misinterpreted. No, no, no. I, no. I, but no, I, I, the, what I'm saying, I, I grew up playing sports. I play high level football, wrestling. I know what sports are about. I'm saying leave it in the realm of sports. Right. I'm not saying, I'm, not, I'm just saying it's, it, it's the grading that's getting in the way. If, if, you, if you don't show up at practice, if the coach saw you down at the market and says you're off the team or wants to make a, a statement to the rest of the guys or however, or gals, however it is, I'm with that. That I'm not advocating less. I'm not, I'm not yeah, I'm not saying let's have less 100%. rigor in sports. I'm yeah. saying I'm just saying let's just take this this crazy weight of like you you're doing what you can. We're okay with it. But unfortunately, it's a graded class, so you're going to get a B minus. Sorry about that. Just ridiculous. That I 100% agree. Yeah. yeah. 100%. So, I mentioned uh, getting back to the thing that you know offering Flexibility and options to students to fulfill PE requirements off campus and other sports. It, it looks great. We're not necessarily opposed to that, but there, there could be consequences, especially in a small, reducing, declining enrollment environment. If enough students do that and those options cost money, see this wrong, it's not cheap. Then you could have a team on campus folding that reduces a free option for many other students. So there are costs potential costs associated with uh, enough students taking part in um, expensive off-campus options whereby a free on-campus option could be eliminated because you don't have kids for the team. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like the charter schoolization of sports. Yeah. And I have to say, in my conversations with you, I appreciated hearing that because I have to say, I racked my brain for an argument against doing this and I couldn't figure it out having talked to you guys about piloting this, so many of those, it gave me a better understanding of all the ramifications. I appreciate that. I get, you know, I, and I more agree with you about this than I do when it comes to academics for the same argument. Um, I, it's just, if we're looking at a student who's like a standout gymnast or, you know, some sport where they're spending you know, 10, 12, or more hours a week working on that for themselves, they're not gonna be on the soccer team instead of doing that. And we're just kind of penalizing them for doing what they love and saying, we're not gonna give you PE credit even though you're an amazing athlete, um, just because. Well, I actually think that's where it began. You know, with, um, I 
think Santa Barbara and Santa Monica, their independent study PD program actually has requirements that you have to be uh, an elite athlete. So I believe that's the genesis of, of this. And now it's it's kind of evolved into some different realms, and, and us being one of them. I mean, we're um, not uh, overflowing with inner elite athletes in this valley or North our high school, so I, I don't think that that's where we need to go, but I do know other districts, that's how they created I just know it's, it's ha in years, in years time, past it has happened. I mean, there have been kids who were spending that kind of time off campus and didn't get credit and had to take basic PE. And some of their coaches really don't want them to be in the PE class where their injuries are possible. Sure, and they can't take other classes that they want to take because they have to take B. Before we move away from A through G to get to the independent study, um, I do have a public speaker form. Marianne wanted to. Are we on A to G? Well, I think we've got A to G yet, but we. Can oh, okay. Get I thought we were okay. I thought yeah. when you were well, I mean, going to independent. Well, I mean, A to G is sort of thread through any of these things. Of course. Well, all right. Um, your choice. Would you like to talk about AG now? We were gonna uh, next on my list was um, online independent study coursework. Where we can. I just didn't know because here it says A through G first. But if you, I don't. Well, I, we are fine. What would you like? We're sort of on the independent study PE, so we'll just keep going. Okay, let's go okay. online independent study PE. So, just by way of introduction, um, Dave's done most of the work on this. I'll just say um, about seven years ago, the year after I started as an assistant principal. Um, I uh, created Digital Mode of High School, so we call it DNHS for short. Um, and that program has evolved to do a lot of different things for us. Totally, completely independent study, online students taking a minimum of four courses uh, on DNHS throughout the year. We use it for credit retrieval for current brick and mortar Nordoff students to retain them because they're just down one class, particularly senior English, so they can stay and graduate with their cohort. Uh, we could use it in some home hospital situations, so we've, we've utilized it, and um, you know, obviously we know there's families have a lot of options. Those options are only increasing with uh, charter schools, and so it's good for us to reflect on the extent to which we're being flexible and uh, offering that online option. So, yeah. yeah, I think that's the general theme that uh, this one just adds to, is just trying to be flexible, knowing that, one, that we are a school that has uh, declined by nearly half over the last decade, uh, which caused us to cut, you know, several classes and some of our advanced classes as well. So um, we've had students, you know, that have interest in other areas, uh, concurrent enrollment, dual enrollment. So we've tried to be as flexible and modern as we could, you know, without you know losing students. So we have a lot of competition. There's a lot of great schools in this valley. And with the uh, increase in charter schools, whether it was here with Valley of Charter or more so in Ventura, um, Golden Valley, uh, Mr. Real Charter, um, we had to try and find some ways to be flexible as well. So what I put together for the board is just kind of a comprehensive look at not only some of the online options, but just other flexible options that we have. Um, we also uh, work with Brigham Young University. They have an independent study branch of high school courses that we work with as well. And typically, you know, it is, as Greg mentioned, credit retrieval, in some cases credit accrual, and, uh, because we don't offer certain classes anymore and a kid had a particular interest, we mentioned marine biology, and you know, we have allowed them to take it at community colleges or online if we didn't offer it anymore because of our decline level. So that's kind of where we're at with you know, online options and just trying to be flexible and looking at, uh, you know, what's, you know, not only going to just benefit the individual student, but you know, also the concept of trying to retain you know high high quality, uh, highly skilled teachers as well. I think you're well aware that uh, you know the difference between how many full time staff members we have and how many part time. You know, it's becoming almost 50 50, so it's it's becoming troublesome for us. But at the same time, we want to still be flexible, and so we have the DNHS, we have the BYU. But we also have some other non-online options as well, trying to help kids get through their high school career uh, either uh, faster or helping them remediate if they had a couple of years. How does that, does that uh, affect, I mean, are students sort of given the option for chaparral or depending on how many 
Right, I mean, that's a recovery, sort of a recovery well, the option. Well, the is, and that's typically for students who are not Many, multiple. Yes, yeah, so okay. I mean, we run the gamut from, you know, those high-performing A to G kids to those kids that, you know, are struggling just to get a high school diploma. You know, our goal, and it's something that I push, is that we want to get them a high school diploma in four years. And even if it meant transferring them to Chaparral to get it there, great. We, you know, four years we want to get a diploma, and then that they can start the post-secondary. So that's where we use Chaparral more uh, in terms of getting them over there in their junior year to retrieve their credits and then come back to us as a senior and that way they can graduate. And those are more seriously credit division students. There's obviously a spectrum of credit division students. Right. So one course and everything else is in line and they're looking to pass all these courses, but it's just this one course that's keeping them off track of graduation. That's sort of something we're talking about. And then we have other students, you know, for various reasons, you know, health reasons uh, may not fit into that particular schedule that we do offer, you know, students to take courses elsewhere uh, under those circumstances. And how does that work with ADA? If they're taking, if they're NORDOM students and they're taking um, APEX, or are there a certain number that they have you know, to take at NORDOM? Yes. yes. My understanding is four. They have to be enrolled in four courses. And those uh, aren't considered Nordoff classes. Which the ones? online classes? It, well, if they're digital Nordoff high school classes, they are. they are. Oh, okay. But my understanding is, and maybe Hank Randy can correct me if I'm wrong. You can't. You, you don't. You have to get. You have to take four courses at the same school. You can't take two digital Nordoff and two brick and mortar Nordoff, and that counts because they're separated. So they have, <coughs> they have to be in four and one or the other. Right. I'm almost sure that's correct. But then, then all the ADA goes to the one, and the other gets none. E, yeah, well, it's the pocket, just the left and the right pocket of the same. Oh, okay, well, but, but I'm, oh, well, I guess I'm thinking about other. We mean brick, brick and mortar. What do you brick I'm and sorry. mortar, not Nordoff? No, Nordoff High School. <coughs> DNS, DHS. Okay. Digital Nordoff High School. So if a student wanted to say, I want to take two courses here and two courses there, maybe it's an old understanding that's. Um, Again, I have not been in the um, office that manages Digital Nordoff, but I think that was one of the initial concerns is that since they're listed as separate courses according to CalPads or something, or separate schools, you, they, you, you had to have four and one in order to get the ADA. So I'm not, I just, I'm not certain about that. Well, we'll get an answer on that. But where would Digital Nordoff be identified if not at Nordoff? There's no, there's no school called Apex. Right. No, it is. It is a Nordoff school. Right. I, but I think yeah. the question is that well, I think you're. I think I'm just thinking the of them doing ADA. some something else in addition. Oh, to something outside completely. Yeah, oh, something in, outside. in this narrative, there's also the discussion of how we offer classes elsewhere. That's right. No, you have yeah. to. Yeah. In order to receive ADA, you have to be in, enrolled in four courses. Yeah. <laughs> but the students, when you took, when you or Kim have talked with me over the years about enrolling a student or Dave now in digital Nordoff, those are co those are courses with our teachers, right? Yes. Who, who therefore, the student therefore is is expanding his or her Nordoff experience. If there's not some other experience out there that the student's having. That's a right, it's a Nord Nord right, it's a Nord so it doesn't. So the point is, if you had four four brick and mortar, as you call it, in one, you're not taking five courses. You're taking five Nordoff courses. How, did, how is the digital Nordoff course expressed on a transcript? Uh, it's expressed on a Nordoff transcript. I, I don't think that we differentiate. Okay. We don't have any. That's enough on that, but that's, yeah. I don't think there's, I don't think that's the issue. Yeah. The issue is more of what you're talking about. It, well, I'm also just, it's not clear to me, did, did <laughs> teachers create a full semester of videotaped online curriculum? No, digital Nordoff high schools run through uh, Apex, Apex so, online program. Okay, so, so uh, the, the curriculum is Apex's mm -hmm. curriculum. Correct. And I read, you know, and I'm aware of how we monitor it and we meet, mm -hmm. et cetera. And we pay $1,200 per class per student or just per student? Uh, yeah, on average. So you know, we're there's, there's a range of depending on how out. much uh, exactly. teacher no, student right. face time is involved. Because it can be anywhere from an hour to two and a half hours a week. And it's kind of dependent on you know, skill of student, you know, how much teacher face time do they need? Yeah, so we've, the but we've been selective, just so you know, we've been selective about it. It, it is expensive. I mean, you're adding, you're adding on to whatever your per student cost is. Yes, we get ADA, but we get ADA for students who don't take APEX. So, 
you know, that's uh, we don't. There are not that many engagements no. out there right now. I think there, are, I'm thinking ten to fifteen total that I can recall. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, the success rate um, it has become less over the years. You know, because it is a very challenging class. Yeah. And, you know, it's independence. Well, it's not only that it's challenging; it's that it, the perception of it is very distant from the reality. The perception is, oh, I can have all this time at home, and I can work at my own pace, and and it's particularly uh, challenging for parents because parents think that, um, oh, my child is just going to sit at the computer and work through this. But the parents' role with um, online coursework increases dramatically. And many parents might not, even though we try to have very blunt meetings with them and tell them in advance, they might not fully understand the increased role that they have. I have to say I'm thrilled at the progress in online education. I'm, before either of you were in administration, I remember wrestling with previous administrators about any kind of online course for any reason whatsoever. And uh, so I applaud all the progress. I'm, my, my concerns really rise from um, we've got all this cool stuff but we have all these rules about using it. Kind of reminds me of buying a 12-year-old a Ferrari and saying, here, you have this awesome car, but you can't drive it. Um, like, if we offer a course, they can't take an online course. So if they have a conflict in their schedule, they want to take two classes at Nordoff, they want to supplement that with an online course, but we offer it, they can't do it. Um, I, there are a lot of people who homeschool anyway, but we have awesome band and sports and other things that they could participate in, but we don't let them do it because whatever reason. So I, that's what I'm hoping we can have a continuing conversation about. Maybe I have some misunderstandings that you can disabuse me of, but I, I think that there are some real issues there that I'd love to go into in more detail. There may be, but I would absolutely love to sit down with you and we can, anybody else who might be interested in talking about it, to, you know, to hear about maybe some of your previous experiences and, and some of the um, constraints that we're struggling with, you know, and, you know, Shelly, you know, alluded it at the independent study PE, you know, there's some of those constraints about the, you know, potential of, you know, losing a section so that it's, it becomes less available to students who really need it. So there are some constraints out there. Um, but but that's, that's one of the things I'd like to understand because if we're getting ADA for students, then whether they're in the seat or not in the seat. Well, I think it, it does tie into, you know, if they're doing four classes at Nordoff and two online, that's different than if they're, you know, so I think that's, I think yeah, the, years they're, ago they're you couldn't yeah. even leave campus for any reason. You had to do, I mean, in 97, you had to do six. 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 Right. six. That's yeah. why I'm so saying I love, that love what's happened. Right. Yeah. That yeah. floored yeah. me when I heard that. No, big applause for what's six happened. Seven. <laughs> like, <laughs> six on lunch, that was your point. Yeah. 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 And, and I totally understand the sports thing. I mean, if you can't get four players on a basketball team because somebody's off <laughs> doing <laughs> tiddlywinks or something, then uh, you've got a real problem. Mm -hmm. But if you're, you know, if you have 11 instead of 12 in a, you know, math class or something, it doesn't change the financial. Well, I think anything you know, you know, is 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 up for debate. You know, I think that maybe what we're concerned about is that, you know, who has access to the school? Because if you know, for example, yeah, if a student wanted to take you know a math course somewhere else. Now, is that open to every student? And then when you look at, you know, not just an individual case, but when we take the long view of it, that if we make this available to all students, then, you know, we're not just talking about one, you could be talking about 30, you could be talking about 60, you could be talking about 90. Now, realistically, would that many students, you know, actually take that option? No. no. Yeah, well, and you can do, but, you have to apply. I mean, that's, I mean, right, my students, my son. But also, even the state of California has limits on, let's say, their independent study program, is they will not allow, I think it's either 5 to 10% of your student population. Yeah, yeah. yeah, may not. And so that's kind of the idea um, that they are concerned about is, 
is the access. Is that we want to make it equitable, we want to make it fair. So if we have programs, that's what we believe in, is that if we offer it to one, we should offer it to another. And then, you know, you open up, why not stop at math? Why not English? Why not science? Why not What kind of stuff? percentage are we running right now on uh, number? Our max is 5%. Are we at yeah, four or one right. or two? Very, very, very few. But, um, yeah. well, that's negligible. Yeah. We're talking about an best study for digital middle of high school. Well, for whatever the California the requirement is. I don't uh, we're pretty close. So we every year we push the, the max about you know, whatever it is, five, six, seven, eight percent, we are close to that. So we actually, um, in some instances, have turn away students who want to take independent study simply because we hit that gap. Uh -huh. and, but, you know, that fluctuates their cycles. So some years it's more um, in demand than other years. So maybe we could have a, a waiting list or something. Yeah, and that's why I'm saying that, you know, we can debate it, we can open a discussion, we can look at that, you know, where do you want to set a cap, you know, and then what are the um, constraints of that cap? You know, is it first come, first serve? You know, do you have specific circumstances? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's where, you know, we can further the discussion and hammer out some of those logistics if that's where we want to go. That'd be fantastic, yeah. I'd like to move us forward. Is that okay? I'd like to ask Maybe. one question. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of tangential, ten, sort of off. Um, that you talked about, uh, Offering DNH, uh, DN, uh, DNHS for kids who want to go to El Camino mm -hmm. because but it, because we can't compete with the Ventura College option. What is that? Help me understand why we can't compete because I'm not clear what what El Camino does. has an agreement with Ventura College so that high school students in El Camino have priority for registration. Is that an articulation agreement or is it just because they're on campus or that or? Is, that's a special agreement they have. That's and, not, that's and why a have we agreement. tried to duplicate that? All other high school students are last priority in the list of uh, registrations. Now, so, yes. have we had conversations that we approached Ventura College to I see have if asked. we could do something I, I have said, oh, I a great candidate for having a special agreement with because many of our students go to SBCC. Mm -hmm. more, About half to go to, to right. go on, yes. Um, and I uh, haven't gotten as far as I hoped with that. Let's talk. Well, we just, uh, about three or four weeks ago, we've met with the, the administration at Ventura College discussing uh, dual enrollment uh -huh. um, and you know there's some great ideas but the one thing they did say is that you know they would not you know start a camp a uh, course on a high school campus without it being filled at the college campus first so in, in essence they were telling us the same thing is that we are a lower priority in terms of starting a dual enrollment program on the high school campus you know if they cannot fill those same classes at the college campus they they reckon so so they're so they're through. pushing away FTES at here because they're not getting it there a little bit here's here's what's happening yes, yes, we can't they're they're saying we want to offer concurrent enrollment class that means we're going to send our teacher to Nordoff to teach an after school class we can't fill an after school class with the number of students they need they say we need 25 30 kids in that room for us to offer the class we can't we we got that once. And we just can't, because you know how um, uh, you know how busy our students are after school. Right, but concurrent enrollment is not guaranteed admission, right? And El Camino, what I thought I heard you say, is yes. El Camino has El guaranteed Camino admission. El Camino is, and they, those students are in college classes at Ventura College at their location. Okay, so that's why they're here. That's right. Okay. So the, the, the model that I've been trying to push them towards is dual enrollment. Dual enrollment happens quite a bit in SBCC. Ventura, by their own admission, they've been reluctant or late adopters. So you can do dual enrollment a couple different ways. They can send a, a teacher down to your campus so they're teaching the class in our classroom during the one through six day. Or if you have a teacher with a master's uh, in that subject area, that teacher can be a, sort of a dual BC teacher and NORDOF teacher, and those students get NORDOF and BC credit. Those teachers are hard to come by. We have one. Is that Manuela in there? I'm sorry? Is that Manuela? That's Manuela who would qualify. She <laughs> also happens actually to be a BC instructor. Right. So, but it's not. It's not been easy. I mean, the, the bottom line is everyone's sort of fighting for students and money and. The, the kind of agreement that we need is one that wouldn't necessarily benefit Ventura College. So, 
we're we're still working on it. Still working on it. I'll give it up. Is it possible to hold these classes? I American popular music, is that what it was that didn't go? That was, that was one of them, yes. That, one of them. And it was right after school. Is there a possibility of doing it in the evening and both adults and high school students? We've tried that. We've had that in the past. A, yep. a long time long ago. A long time ago. A long time ago, time ago. right. And we, we have considered offering them in the evening as well, but we, we, we simply can't get enough students either way. And when we, Carly actually gets stipended if the class runs by VC to, to coordinate these classes. So she does a lot of work trying to set up these classes, uh, generate interest and enrollment, and then they fizzle. So I think out of the last, let's say four times, we've, uh, they've been canceled three of the four because we haven't had enough students. And we, she works with students, say, when, when is the course the best fit? What, or what time would you be able to come? What kind of course would you like? Um, and that's actually, it's, that's, when we went to this meeting, that's what Boyna said. Look, we, it's really hard for us to fill after school classes. The same kids that want to do that are also involved in three other things after school or in the evening. So uh, it's not just not enough. The last question on the same subject, a uh, broad one. In our last uh, budget meeting, we were brainstorming about you know revenue sources. Are you familiar with any uh, opportunity that we might have to use online school to capture um, ADA for kids that are absent. Is it possible? Sort of like a Saturday school. Exactly, but program. but in real time, possibly, or, you know. You no, know, I'm. Part of that sounds a little familiar. I, I'm not. Okay. Yeah, if you're not, you I'm know, not. I'm not. I, I don't know. Future if I'm research. You know. Yeah. You know, getting high school students to um, do something, anything like Saturday school, because they missed, is a challenge. <laughs> Yeah, I just wondered, and we'll look into it, obviously. I yeah. just wondered if, if you, you know, I'm thinking more like someone's sick, they could be online, but they can't come to class. Is that a way, you know, are, is, are they expanding? That's interesting. Uh, you know, capture into that. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's happening somewhere. Yeah. Thanks. Like Skyping in. A to yes. G? A to G? A to G? A to G? A to G? Yeah. A to G? Yeah. Is that my library? Okay, you see CSU A to G. Um, obviously, it's been in the news a little bit lately, and so that, that piques folks' interest. And you see A to G is increasingly becoming one of the metrics by which a high school is determined to be successful. Um, we actually just spent a nice afternoon with uh, Gene Moore, who's the education writer for uh, VC Star, and she, by own admission, came in saying she, you know, she was sort of writing an article about what schools are doing to increase their A to G rates. And after our conversation, I did share with her the same thing that I wrote to all of you. She was very pleased and thankful that somebody explained things in terms of tensions, because I, I guess in um, some of her other conversations or research that didn't necessarily come through. So, in writing what I wrote, talking about the tensions that exist in my view, between UC, A to G, and some other considerations and values and goals in education. Um, my hope is only that everyone thinks about it really thoroughly or any conversation that's had, that it's at least backgrounded by understanding that there is sometimes, when you stake out one territory, you're giving up another, and there are some forced choices involved. And I am not advocating um, for uh, that we Put a stop to any initiative that would increase our rates. In fact, what we presented with science would increase our rates, our A to G rates, because um, students would be at least A to G in science sooner, because they'd have the D uh, lab physical science in their freshman year, and then the D required life science uh, their sophomore year. So currently, it takes them to get to their junior year to have it in three years. So um, my, I'm, I'm mostly interested in finding out what your reflections are after reading what I wrote and your reflections, your questions about those tensions that might exist. And it really, in some ways, references, um, Jane, what you said earlier, right, about College CTE. And, yeah. and that's one of the reasons why, if you go on the UCAG website, they're, they're very public and proud about their 
work in expanding UC A to G qualifications of courses to CTE courses. They're trying to include CTE courses in their, um, and they're casting a wider net because they recognize that, that tension. Now that, that does mean that some CTE courses will need to be, there needs to be more writing, more reading, more academic work in order for the UC to recognize them, but that, that might be positive regardless. Sure, it might be interesting to see if that actually affects retention rates at uh, you know two-year universities because the kids are so I, I, I got that yeah. I've been doing yeah. that you know yeah so um, it was a, a lengthy document and so I thought maybe what I'd do is uh, for the benefit of our or maybe not to the benefit of our listeners and viewers just briefly describe each tension uh, very quickly so the tension between minimum graduation requirements why do we have minimum graduation requirements, but then work to exceed those in some cases. Does that potentially increase dropout rates? Uh, Jane, like you were saying. What about uh, the economics and staffing constraints? The more that a school moves towards UCA to G requirements for their graduation requirements, the more courses beyond a four period day, because you only get paid ADA for four periods, so that means that fifth and sixth course you are teaching for free, sort of. So. Um, there are economic and staffing constraints to consider. Also the opportunity costs, again, the electives, particularly if a student is struggling to get a C, because remember, the only way you can get A to G credit for a course is that you get a minimum of a C and it has to be a college prep course. So that means students getting Ds, I can graduate with a D, D gives me graduation credit, but uh, I, if the goal is for me to be UC A to G, I've got to retake that course now uh, and remediate somehow and get a, get a C. Um, the tension between college and career readiness, if college readiness is UC A to G, um, is, call, is career readiness the same thing? That's what the Common Core is trying to actually say, that they're the same thing. We don't have to have that big debate anymore about tracking students toward direct post-secondary careers versus direct to college, they're one and the same, they're one and the same. And maybe that's just changing the terms of the debate, or maybe that's true based on uh, the economic trends of our, of our country and the job market. Or maybe it's not. <laughs> or maybe it's not. <laughs> the tension between uh, UCAG requirements and community college um, enrollment, which does not require any of those, um, any of those requirements doesn't even require a college, or doesn't even require a high school diploma. What an initiative for increased UCAG would mean for Nordoff, and I, and I briefly described what that would mean. You'd see probably dramatic increases in um, language other than English, that's the foreign language, L-O-T-E. If, if, if a school were to move their graduation requirements closer to UCAG, that's probably the area that would be affected the most, because right now only um, really college-bound, college-minded students are um, taking two years of the same foreign language. And so UCAG is minimum of two years of the same, strongly recommended three, and that's usually the case for even science. Two minimum, these are minimums. And if a student only does minimums, what we all know is that it's so competitive out there, it, it's not gonna get you very far come application season if you have done the minimum, just not. So, um, do they, um, is sign language considered a foreign language? Yes. It is now, that's yep. new. And we have several students, uh, several graduates this year that fulfilled their AG requirement off campus with American Sign Language. They pay for it separately, like a class? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think they did it at SBCC one day, SBCC one day at BC. Um, on the first page, you were talking about um, Nordoff High School counselors and how they meet with students and help them. Is this um, is that something that's kind of new, like new within five years? No, no, that's that's always been the case. When I, which I know it is not the case at other high schools. Um, so they have individual private conversations with each and every student, and they say, "Here, you are currently A to G. Here's what you need to stay in A to G. You are not A to G. Here's what you need to do to get back on A to G." So that A to G conversation is actually um, very prominent in all those registration meetings. So, um, I do feel like I, I, I hear it a lot now, and certainly since that uh, that adoption a couple years ago of that great ninth grade 
uh, oh, okay, work. Focus, but, focus, right. um, but I, I do know kids from four and five years ago who found out their junior year that they weren't on track and were really upset about it. So that's why I was asking. It was like, well, I would say I would say this. Um, I know those conversations happen. I'm, I'm, I was often in the room when they were happening. It's in the library that all the English classes come in. The counselors sit up front. They call them up each one at a time, and they work out their registrations. Um, and I know that Dave could say the same thing. Whether or not the student fully understands it or is able to remember that conversation that they had, I, that's something that maybe sometimes happens. And didn't we, with budget constraints, have it to lose counselors, right? We, we like, way cut back on counselors. And counselors, counselors actually not so much. In fact, awesome. actually, the ratio now is better than it was before. Yeah. Like we had, we basically had uh, three full-time counselors for 950. Now we have 2.46, who is Brownman 2.4? 2.4. 2.4, 2.4 for 690. So we're actually in a stronger position. We've retained that and did that consciously. So Jane, I can't go back, you know, four or five years and, you know, say definitively what the counselors are doing, but, you know, in just my first year working with them, um, you know, even when a kid wants to drop a class, if it is a class that no longer makes them A to G, that's a very pointed conversation that we have with them and their parents. So, you know, I don't approve any drop under those circumstances unless, you know, not only the student knows, but the parent knows as well. And I mean, we've all got to the point where we've had them sign a contract stating, hey, look, this is, that's you know, great. the consequences of this action. We don't want to go there, but we want to make sure you're well informed that that is the case if you drop this particular class. So, you know, the, the, the counselors really, you know, from my experience, are on the conversation. Can, can you, I mean, obviously the big question here is, though, what do we, what would we do? What, I mean, you, you hit on it a little, but I mean, you know, can you speak more to, like, you know, what would we do if we decided um, we we're going to sort of do something different and more intense to if, encourage A through G? It, if we decided A to G rates are the goal, and I mentioned this in here, it's worth noting, that that could be a laudable goal, but you have to understand right now we have far more students that are A to G than actually go to directly to a four-year school. So that's not is what's preventing four-year, direct to four-year enrollment. And oftentimes that's used as a proxy for that. People talk about A to G rates because that's how much how many kids are going to college. That's, that's not. I mean, what's preventing students from going to college is the cost of college, plain and simple. So, you know, and that's something I told Gene, like if our society really wants to see an increased college enrollment and they understand the consequences of everyone going to college, can that create a functioning society? I, you know, that's another debate. But you lower the cost of college. That will revolutionize education more so than any other thing you can do. Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the truth. That's the truth. So, not trying to get political, not campaigning for anyone, but uh, that is absolutely the truth. But Greg, what I'm saying is, Taking away that, because I agree that's the main discussion, but taking that away and just assuming we decided we wanted to increase A through G uh, participation, what what would we do? Yeah, what would that look like? What, how would it be different than now? The right. biggest difference, Thank the, you. Yeah, well, you'd have to, if you want to increase it, again, I know that you can do it one of two ways. You can mandate it by in, in, increasing your graduation requirements oh, so that it's just Required, and we can legally do that. I would think that absolutely. Would, absolutely. Yeah. California State offers minimums, and a district can go beyond those minimums at their own peril or pleasure. Wouldn't so. well, okay. So I mean, that's it, right? That's the first step. Right? That's the first step. But in general, whether you have a school of seven hundred or twenty-seven hundred, when you start moving toward a higher intensity of academic completion, mm -hmm. i.e., to G, there's absolutely, particularly in a smaller school going to be a fallout on electives, right? That's right. I mean, the kids are not going to take six. No. Yeah, gonna... that, I mean, that's very, the, the most obvious example is Spanish and French. Students are going to be in Spanish and French longer or they'll be there where they weren't there before and they're not in other electives. So again, there is a cushion that we have because we do have students on four and five period days. So some of that could be absorbed yeah. without um, uh, removing students from elective seats, but that it depends on how far you want to go with mandating certain things. So again, I, I mentioned other schools.
try to promote and encourage. And we do that, we promote and encourage. Some students, or some schools have promote and encourage uh, mandating, like AVID. So we, we, we're not gonna mandate you have these courses that get you into college by requiring them for graduation also, but we're gonna mandate that everyone's in an AVID course because that's sort of designed to you know, uh, encourage you, inspire you, study skills to help you do those things anyway. So it really depends on what model you want to pursue. The required mandatory graduation requirement model or the encouraged model, which is what we do, uh, or we think of some other ways to encourage. One of the way, one, one of the things, obviously, that UCAG is doing is uh, trying to designate more CTE courses as UCAG. But truthfully, that's a tricky business because it takes special teachers. I mean, there are special teachers that teach CTE, and then to have that teacher be able to do the CTE components as well as the academic components that are required for UCAG, that's, that's a challenge. It's a staffing challenge. I think we also would have for our population at Nordoff, we would have to look at um, our, our, our ESL population and say, how, how can we, if they're in ninth grade English support, how do, they, how do we get them that ninth grade English? Right, so as I mentioned, the, the special education students and EL students, uh, unless they transition fairly quickly out of the EL program, they are not AP. That's in your graph, you show yeah. that. Yeah. And maybe it's <coughs> the topic of encourage, but maybe there could be a special designation on the diploma. Or you know, we've talked about that. We've talked about an honors diploma, but then, you know, it's a very public way, uh, a potentially public way of, you know, that could either be an encouragement, an inspiration, or it could be seen as negative. Uh, differentiating students in that way. And some people might say, you know. Differentiating students on their achievement? Well, they, but I don't think that's the opposite of what we're talking about. We're trying to get the students who aren't achieving it to get to achieve it. So adding an honor. So you have to ask yourself, were well, those students who are not achieving it, would they be lured by the prospect of having an honors diploma? Because honors diploma, what does that do for them anyway? Right. No, I have no idea if it's a good idea or not. Yeah. I, I am with you. I have no idea. <laughs> Um, is it only if you go to a four-year college? Because there are, like, if, if the real issue is money, which I think it probably is, it is. then no why are we not encouraging kids to go to community colleges so that they can not pay as much for those first two years and then move on to a four-year college? And aren't we still we absolutely do. with the community college? The first year coming out of high school is free. Yeah. These problems, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I just, so, so, so we do. We so, so, right. we, we absolutely encourage all the students. Look, this if you're not uh, financially able yeah, yeah. to go to a four year college, we're always pu pushing post secondary options. So, even for yeah. CTE minded students, um, uh, getting a uh, certificate, they're going to be more competitive in the job market. It's going to lay a better foundation for them in the future should they want to expand. But, so, I, but I don't yeah, even absolutely. mean CTE, like, I went to a community college, my stepson went to a community college. I mean, there, there are feeder college, like, he went, he was not a student, and he would say that coming out of high school, but went to Berkeley City College, and then graduated with honors from Berkeley, you know? So it's like, because it was a feeder school that allowed for him to grow up and yeah. do what he needed to do, and there are all kinds of feeder schools at all of the UCs. So I'm just wondering if we're if we were making a, more of a focus on some of the community colleges where kids didn't think they had to go to UCSB. UCSB I don't, I don't think that, that we don't push that. That's the okay, way so, to think. No, okay, not at all. So I just no. don't, I don't but, know. But, so but the reality, Angie, the reality is, if you go back and look at our last five graduating classes, mm -hmm. the mean average percentage of students going direct, directly to four-year school is hovering in the low 30s. The mean average going to directly to a two-year school or soon after graduation is hovering around 50. Okay. So there, we have a much higher percentage of students doing exactly what you're saying. What we don't have, and it might be, it might be geographical, Mike, you could help with this. When you were describing that feeder thing, right. I don't know that we have a feeder system, right? 
I mean, there's... Okay, there you go. City College, absolutely. No, right, I was, I was, I was, there you go. Okay, yeah. I was thinking more in the, among the three... And Santa Monica goes straight into UCLA. Right, among the, the uh, more among did the have three have colleges. agreement with UCLA at one point, at least. And Cuesta has one at... But you're saying the you, Channel, Channel Islands? Working the Channel Islands, I've been talking to a couple of others, but CSUCI is the one they talk so about. So right, so that is, makes this sense. All, this makes all good, but it's important to say that Remember, UCA to G is for direct admission. Right. So yeah. if you're a student that already knows I can't afford college, pushing this student to the UCA to G when he knows he doesn't need that to be at a community college, that's a, that's, that could be a hard sell. I can tell him, look, you're going to be far more prepared even at yeah. a community college with UCA to G. Well, you know, I'll, I'll do that when that comes. Why the A to G now? And to add on to that, I mean, we, you know, we have kids that don't necessarily even you know, think about going from a two-year to a four-year. I mean, we have some great, you know, certificate programs at Ventura College, and we have kids that have gone directly from Nordoff into those programs into a very well-paying job. Right. And these people have come back, you know, they are successful members of our community, you know, they're raising, you know, their families in our community and participating. Uh, and so I, I feel like, you know, the UCA to G conversation is good, but I think it's just one part of, something that's bigger for Nordoff and what Nordoff represents in terms of the Ohio Valley. So, you know, I, I, I think, Angie, like you're saying, is it's that's great for a certain segment of our population, but that isn't just, doesn't apply to all of our kids. You know, and some like the community college options, and some just, you know, we got military, we also have, you know, those that go right in the certificate program. So, you know, for us, I think, you know, I like the model that we have, that encouragement model, but also still respecting a student's choice of what they want to do post-secondary. And not everybody wants to go to a four-year university. So, you know, I, I just am hesitant to mandate anything and tell a family, like, no, this is the best for your kid. Even though they may have relatives, you know, who've just gone into fire science and become a fire. Uh, fire. So it's, but isn't the, isn't, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that part of the challenge here is that we're forcing kids to make these decisions earlier and earlier and earlier in terms of what career track they want to follow. You said something about the, the whole AG being contra to the intellectual exploration thing. But I mean, we even see it at the, at the college level, right? I mean, when I went to college, it was not which is a long time ago, you know, we used candles and parchment. Turn of the but, century. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, the other, the, the, the other, the other the side. tree and, you know, well, like yeah, the but, what, why, why do we have an educational system? Are we, do we want intellectual enrichment or do, or do we want our kids to have jobs? But I increasingly mean, yes, our yes, funding yes, yeah. is tied to being job ready, right? right? Increasingly our funding, at least right. our community college from Sacramento, is all about employability. It's not about intellectual exploration. It's not about feed your mind. It's not about learn for the sake of learning. Um, no, it's not. It's about become useful. Right. Um, and it seems like we're even doing the same thing now at the high school level, is that if you, you would need to be thinking about if you're going to go to a four-year when you're a freshman. But I think that that's what happens in a in an increasingly competitive environment. That's what we're in. And the sacrifice, though, is that if you're forced to make that decision, I mean, the trade-off, right? right? If you're forced to make that decision earlier, there's a lot of stuff you don't know because you haven't been down those roads yet. So I don't know what the answer to that is, but I think I agree with you that mandating AG is not doesn't make sense, right? Um, but ignoring it and not pushing it doesn't make any sense either because there are... There are penalties to pay down the road for wrong decisions early on, regardless of whether you have enough information to make that decision, because uh, the world doesn't care, right? So, so I, I, I like that we keep all these options, but I think we really need to be sure that folks understand AG and, and what the long-term consequences of not being there are. Well, you know, that, again, it just reminds me of that life at a comprehensive high school. Look, our job is to be a little bit of everything to everyone, and the more that you emphasize something, you, you de-emphasize something else. So it, there is a very uh, challenging balance to be had. Yeah, it's tough. It's and it tough. sounds like that balance is if you, if you push that A to G hard enough, you have a higher dropout rate. That's right. So you just if you don't have work. good remediation models or a financial commitment for those models or a way to get those kids in the door to, to remediate. Yeah. Like you so. said, trade-offs and opportunity costs. You know, I know some schools have increased, uh, maybe probably 
end of year. Some schools have, and I don't think I mentioned this in other areas, some schools have A to G course requirements more in line with their graduation requirements, but they don't require the C. So they're, in other words, you can graduate, you have to take A to G courses to get your diploma, but you don't have to be A to G. So in other words, you can get D's in those classes. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so. Mary Ann, did you want to? I won't say everything I'd like to say about it, but I strongly, um, I've thought about AGG for many years. Um, it's been a huge debate in the communities that I've covered. Um, I think that A to G is about preserving options for kids. Um, and I know plenty of kids who are not able to contemplate their entire future when they're in high school and all of the things that are going on. And I have helped kids um, apply for colleges who have not had their A to G requirements, have been very disappointed and have had different have had um, taken different tacks. So um, I think that the A to G issue can be addressed very simply with systems in place. So at the end of the day, it's gonna be up to a kid and a family on, um, on what they're gonna do. But if we have a system in place that walks them through it, that they're making um, these very conscious decisions with their parents, um, I think that that will increase the A to G. I'm surprised that we're saying, do we want to increase A to G? That, that's, that we're not starting out that we do want to increase A to G. So that's a debate that I would love to have. I would love to have this conversation go beyond um, a school board meeting um, um, section and have like a task force discuss. I think I mentioned that to you. Um, because it is, it is so key to not whether we're going to a four-year college, but what are our kids learning? Do they know how to read and write? And do they know how to do math? And 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 and, and I would hope that they would know a, a second language. And um, to me, it's not whether they're going to go into a two-year or a four-year. It's what they're going into life equipped to have. And um, and we can't mandate, obviously, but I think we can set a system in place where they're more likely to have an A to G. And what I envision that. And my just just my very basic um, response is having an opt out, where it's an opt out form where the kid has to sign, they have to completely understand, and the parents have to sign. So that would be a system in place that would address the A to G. Um, Santa Paula just talked about a transcript evaluation service. They have so many kids; it's so hard to go through all of your transcripts to see. Did all the kids meet with their counselors and did they fill, do the proper thing? So they have an actual automated computer system called a tra TES, Transcript Evaluation Service. I think that would be fantastic just to be able to do a run of all the transcripts to see who's on track, who's not, and then have that conversation with them. Um, Simi Valley's had this conversation. They think it's really important and they're tying their superintendent's compensation to how many kids are completing A to G. So we're all over the map in terms of the county um, I would like us to see the question, do we, do we want A to G? I would love to just have that, 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 that long discussion. The fact that special ed does not, does, does not count as A to G, um, you know, there are probably a lot of reasons for that. I just talked to a mom whose kid just told his parents he, he wasn't going to do special ed anymore and he's an attorney now. But that was a kid who was a special ed all through his, his grade school education um, and he's now an attorney. So I don't know, um, I don't know, that's, that's, that's way beyond me. Um, one of the issues that I have is early um, language learning. It makes no sense to me at all that we're teaching our kids languages in high school. Um, obviously there's a staffing issue. How are we gonna all of our kids in, in the grade school? But maybe there's more of an emphasis on the immersion, but the, um, the early language learning would, um, would take care of a lot of, a lot of these um, um, L-O-T-E, which I'd never heard of that before. Um, the D, I mean Ds, you're not going to be prepared in your math or your science or English if you're D. So all of our Nordoff High School requirements, you can graduate with Ds. Um, the, way to, the way to address that, if you have a D, you have to go to summer school. You have to go to this after school program for remediation. You have to go to Ventura College and maybe we have a fund that pays for that. <coughs> so that's just... Um, 30% is not enough because we know bachelor's degrees are like the, the high school um, diploma. Um, I just want to preserve the options for our kids. Um, more, 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 the jobs that we are having for the future are requiring these skills 
to be able to read, write, and do math at a beyond a D level, a C level. So if that's, if all of these things, like the thing that I see is the biggest difference between our Norwich High School requirements and our, and our A through G is getting a D. There should be a remediation offer, whether the kids can, can get beyond that D is up, you know, is up to them, but there should be a remediation, a safety net. That's what I love about Mattel Hub. Mattel has safety net, safety net, safety net. They are catching those kids. They are setting high standards. Not everyone can meet those, but they have safety nets for them. And so, um, a D, forget it. Um, our Nordoff High School requirements should be more than that. And I would love to see more of our kids beyond 30%. It might not be 100%. I don't think it'll ever be 100%. But it could sure as heck be, I think, 80, 85, 90%. So that's that's all I have to say. I have I have more, but I would really love to have just to start off the, the, the base question is is A to G something that we want to pursue or not? So that's my thing. For now. Thank you. Thank you. Craig, I have a question. When you were talking about kids who go to the uh, two year university, you said around fifty percent. Is that four, two and four years fifty, or it's fifty no, to two it's years fifty? Thirty aside from the thirty that are going directly. So that's 80%, where 80% are going to some sort of post-secondary. Oh, the, one thing I want to add is I'm not sure that the two-year kids are going. No, they're not, years. but that's not I, our I issue. That's pretty low. That's it is low. The community. It's low? Yeah, it uh, varies by high school, but across across the community colleges with which we uh, participate, the, the norm is about 20 25%. Um, I think one thing that strikes me, um, and, and it's frankly included in, in Mary Ann's comments, is the, is the reality that a lot of this would be probably, if not taken care of, it would certainly be better informed if we really had parental engagement in this subject, and, and kid engagement in it. You know, and, and I gotta tell you, you know, I, I see apathy mm -hmm. in every direction. I see board meetings that are unattended. I see um, parent-teacher conferences that not that many people show up to. I see back-to-school nights that are not very well attended. Um, you know, it just seems to me that that if we could find ways of better, I mean, I think Marianne's right. It, it would, it's a shame if a freshman with great talent is somehow brought into our school system and through no fault of her own never flourishes or is challenged to do what she could have done um, but that said I'm not sure how many of those people really exist it seems like for the most part um, you know you have you have students who are motivated to go to a UC who probably you know, are kind of thinking in those terms, have parents that are engaged and so forth, you know, early in that process. So, so where the inflection point where we're not, where, where, where we have, you know, where we could do better, I'm, I'm thinking is really in engaging the parents. You know, I mean, Marianne said about, you know, it would be great to, to have someone know, as you said, Dave, you kind of already do, which is to say, you are now at a fork in the road. And you're about to take the left, and you, if you stayed right, you could go to a UC, and you're going to give that up. But, but I, I think there are plenty of people who show up as freshmen, relatively unengaged parents, never really understand the whole A through G thing, and. But well, we have a system in place. It's a four-year yeah. planning workshop that we offer uh, in the morning and in the evenings for families, students, and parents. So we. We have a system in place. Are we getting good not, attendance? Not, but that's, yeah, that's the yeah. issue. What about, what about Get Focus, Stay Focus? That program, doesn't that have, right, doesn't that have a component as well though, as far as educating students on yeah, the, really the, thinking about that? Get Focus, Stay Focus, yeah. students through UCAD, all those things. So now, and it's an actual course. It's not just in the side conversation with the council that you have. It's embedded in the course. But the, the parent issue is. You're right, Kevin. Different. I would love to know how I can get more parents at those meetings. <laughs> Because they're available, <coughs> and we advertise them. We just can't get the numbers. Do you know how? What? And so we're even thinking about, you know, creating like a webinar. You know, mm -hmm. making them in case they can't show up at that particular time. So we um, are trying to work with um, our technology and our um, 
video productions class to create something that a parent can access that same information online, you know, even if they can't make an in-person meeting. So we are trying to be creative to get that information out to more parents even if they can't show up to our meeting. Do you know what percentage um, of students at Nordoff are from, would be first time college students in their family? First ones in their family? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I actually remember, I think I looked at that data with you a long time ago, and we looked at uh, front levels of education in the Ohio Valley. And I remember when we compared it to other parts of West Ventura County, exactly the same, no difference. Um, and I don't recall what it was. It's also, that's a bigger indicator of whether they'll go to college than what the high school is doing. Well, or yeah, I don't parents know, I can engage know. with A to G and understand what that is and what that means and, and you know, knowing who your audience is. But remember, uh, I, I just want to make sure that everyone understands what that looks like when you're sitting across the desk from a parent at a counseling meeting. It's, well, I, I, I can't afford to go to college. We're, we're, we're not going to take on a giant burden of debt. So why are we even having this conversation? It's not even that. I mean, I, I you know, because I've talked to some students whose parents are like, you know, they, that's just a foreign concept to them. No, you, you're, you know, you're a young girl. You're going to graduate from high school and you're going to get a job and have get married and have children. I mean, that's still, you know, for for a young student at uh, Nordoff whose parents didn't go to college, who has that dream. That's a they have they are fighting inside their home to get that dream to be accepted. I mean, that's not an easy, it's not just a, I mean, right, we think, oh, a parent would go, oh, I'd love my child to even go to the two-year college. That's not, that's not what a, some of these families, I mean, I don't know if it's 20% or 30%, but there is a percentage of families who are like, no, that's not what, what you're gonna do. Shelly, I'm gonna take a stab at, at that number. I, I believe it was uh, our most recent Healthy Kids survey which surveys freshmen and juniors, so you know about half the class. And, and if I recall, there there was a category there, and I believe it was either in the thirty to forty percent of students whose parents had a high school diploma. And that was it. So if that's close, you know, thirty to forty percent of our students, just that, that ninth and eleventh grade year, that their parents did not go to college. Is, is there a way any kind of way. to interact with those parents uh, at a, when their kids are younger. And I, I know that sounds sort of strange, oh, but no. like I have counseled several parents of my former kindergartners whose children are going off to college, and they said, well, they want to go, but we, I don't know how. And then I said, well, here's what you do. This is what you do, this is what you do, this is what I did to make it so they understood. And I went through all the steps, and they went, oh, I had no idea. So I'm wondering if there's a, like a, was a little card or something that where, you know, mm -hmm. as an elementary teacher, because we see those parents all the time. Yeah. So it's yeah. not a step, it's not an extra step to go to the high school to talk to or go to a meeting. We see them, we see parents all the time where we can simply say, you know, we check in, I check in with parents. How are, you, how are you doing? What's your child? Where, where are they? Oh, you know, here's a card. Let me tell you how this works. We and thought about asking, like uh, you know, depending upon our counselors, despite the uh, more relaxed counselor-student ratio, mm -hmm. of having them go to elementary schools and do some um, some outreach work there throughout the year, sort of built into their schedule. So, I, I think that would be a great idea. Yeah, I, I just. I well, yeah, I, was I think that we approach the parents so much more often, and if you've never gone to college, and then you're going to go speak to a high school teacher, or you have a high school diploma, right? And then you then you're going to go to the high school and talk to those teachers about your child going to college. It to me that would be daunting. I think I would be overwhelmed with that idea. Um, but if you're going to the elementary teachers who you have a relationship with, maybe there's a system we can, just like, just like you were saying, a system in place that says, well, here, here are the steps that you can do. And, oh, you need, you need student aid? Well, gosh, this is in place, this is in place. 
this is where you go. This is how you do it. Where, you know, I, get, I, mean, I don't know. You're talking about affording college or both, uh, being what, eligible or what? Uh, what? What my child wants to go to college, they're expecting to go. This was the conversation I had. My child wants to go to school. They're expecting to go to UC Davis, Stanford, UCLA. And I know that I know the parent and I went, okay, so here's what we did. Your child should go to, um, you know, this, go, go, go check out and see if there's a community college that's a theater school. You can afford that. You do this, do that. Yes, some of these places have dorms you can stay at. And then when you get there, ask them about the, these are the four questions you need to ask. So it's, it's like, what are the, there are kids who want to go, but whose parents, like you said, are like, there's no way. But if we don't <coughs> help the parents figure out and give them a place where it's approachable for them, then they're not gonna know what to do and then it's gonna be an automatic, no, you're not going to college. Why no, should they go? Right. What does it take to do it, and then how can I afford it? Yeah, it's you know? just too, too fear. There's too, too much fear. I mean, I remember looking at the data before, and you could almost predict 100% which kids were going to go to college and at what level just based on the parents' education. Absolutely. Which is a sign. I mean, I wish there were a way that we could change that a little bit. So not maybe, by getting the kids to not go to college. Yeah. But, well, yeah. after the way, we have that. We have right. So I would like to say, you know, if, if there's a, an opportunity out there to have a, a powwow, that would be great. But I, I do want to push our meeting on to our other agenda items. So I thank you for coming. Thanks, 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 Thanks a lot. We're going to give us a few minutes break. So Good we'll day. start at uh, 10 to 8. Um, 7.1.1, certificated roll-up of column and step for teachers and management action. Any questions? Would someone like to move to approve that? Oh, this is approved. just the stepping. Yeah. Just the sort of roll up and Do I have a second? A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Resolution 7.1.2 in recognition of Teacher Appreciation Week, May 8th through 12th. There's a long you know sort of whereas but i would like to read the section that said the ojai unified school district board of education has the highest respect and admiration for our teachers of the ojai school district who have dedicated their lives and their talents to the education of our children our most precious and important resource <coughs> a motion to approve the resolution i'll move to approve second second all those in favor aye, aye. aye. None opposed. 7.1.3, resolution in recognition of classified school employee week, which is May 21 through 27. I would like to say our schools are really wonderful, I think, of honoring our teachers and our classified employees. So I'll read the section that says, we're declaring this week as classified school employee week, recognizing the many outstanding contributions and services provided by our classified school employees. <laughs> Motion to approve? I'll move. A second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Thank you. 7.1.4, resolution directing service of final notice of reduction of particular kinds of certificated services. I move to approve. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Okay, uh, 7.5.1, Measure J projects. Andy? Ron, do you want to come on Ron? up as well? <clears throat> so in the interest of time, I won't give uh, much of an introduction. Um, you have notes as far as the update. We just gave you an update two weeks ago. Uh, the big new piece that's developed in the past two weeks is both the expansion of the Myers Oaks roof project. Previously, it was uh, focused on a uh, single wing and the K2 classroom. Now we've expanded to cover a, a little bit larger area of the campus. Um, that's why you'll see the budget number has changed between uh, today, May 2nd, and what you saw two weeks ago. But Ron can go into that a little bit more, but I'll just go ahead and let Ron give you an update on the general uh, 
developments for projects for the summer. Okay, for Measure J, <coughs> basically what we got going for the summer is the Norrup Gym locker room. Uh, it went out to bid, uh, advertising for bid on uh, April 21st. Uh, we're expecting a uh, job walk on Thursday, the 4th here. Uh, for prospective contractors would come and uh, walk the job, take a look at it, see what they're doing so they can properly prepare their bids. Um, May 12th will be the final day for bids. We're really pushing the envelope as far as timing. Uh, a project of this size where you're going out to form a bid usually takes a minimum of six months ahead of time preparation for the uh, preparing of the, uh, the uh, project manuals and stuff like that. I got 172 page project manual just for that particular set of roofs and stuff. So there's quite a bit of paperwork and, and uh, research involved in producing that. Anyway, but we're running it uh, right at the edge. I'm hoping to have uh, it ready for uh, board approval on the June 6th uh, board meeting. So we'll have a, a bids in place and or a recommendation for uh, whom we're going to choose uh, to do the roofing. Um, we're going to push it right up to the edge of um, end of summer school. Uh, will be the beginning time that it can start so we don't have any kids, uh, anything interaction between. And then uh, August 21st, a couple days before school begins to have that completed uh, so that we don't have any interaction between the, uh, the uh, roofing company and um, the starting of school and all the preparations for that. Um, so the cafeteria stage for Nordoff, uh, it's in the final stage of plan uh, preparations right now. Uh, we're waiting for the uh, electrical engineer to finish his, his portion up and then we should have everything ready to go so that we can start the project again right at the beginning or at, uh, right at the end of school, the beginning of summer break. Um, I don't know if we're logistically going to be able to work while summer school's in progress and whether I can cordon it off or it'll just be isolated up and can't have any interaction with the kids. Having the fingerprinting and all that kind of stuff for crews that are coming in is just too uh, costly and laborious to do that. So we're working on that to see if we can to work out something to, uh, to make that work so we can get in, in, into that earlier so they can have their uh, presentation. I think they have a uh, program in September, so hopefully we'll have all that in place and done. Uh, they've gotten a new um, vendor that they're looking at. Actually, it's the same vendor company, but a new uh, gentleman is working on it. This seems to be a lot more user friendly, and I'm getting the information that I really needed three months ago <laughs> to uh, to move forward. With that, and that's why it's taken so long to get it to the engineer. So we got that in place, and and it's moving on quite nicely. And uh, everybody seems to be working well with that. Um, DSA requirements for uh, the Matilha Gym. Uh, the, the locker room and re-roof the barrel roof on that. It's a, it's a um, what they call a summer bell truss. It's a interlocking pieces. It's an old engineering design. It's very strong and very uh, uh, adaptable to the weight, but the D Department of State Architects engineers haven't seen that in a long time, so they're very reluctant. So we're, we're getting it processed through, and we're also going to put on a metal roof. It's the most um, cost-effective and or longest lasting roofs that we could do. It's not much more expensive than a, a conventional type of roof, but the advantages of it are so much greater because that type of roof, uh, you only get about a 10 year warranty off of it because of how all of a sudden the, the things due to the gravity of the, how steep the roof is um, fail quickly. So nobody will give any kind of warranty and obviously we've seen how quickly they fail. I think the roof on this right now is only about 20 years old and uh, many of their that many of the uh, tiles have already fallen off. Uh, anyway, the, the projected life of this is 50 years, and uh, it will probably go even longer. There, there are many, many uh, projects that have gone even longer than that, as long as we take care of it. There's not a whole lot of trees around there, so we're in pretty good shape with that. Barring uh, taking too long on that, I may go ahead and see if we can't do the, the locker rooms and the front foyer. The front foyer is leaking a little bit more than it should, so uh, we may do that portion first, and then, then we can do the uh, the metal later on, depending on what we can come up with. Uh, wasn't, was, wasn't there some issues with the ADA compliance of that gym? 
Uh, about ADA. Yeah, is that the right word for yeah. handicap? <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. That's the exact same thing. Yeah. Uh, there were supposed to be some ADA upgrades to the restrooms, which were not completed at the same time that the uh, um, auditorium was done. Due to funding, that did not take place. Okay. Uh, doing a reroof doesn't kick in. Okay. It, it's basically considered what they consider maintenance okay. of a building, so it, you know it's projecting it. it doesn't kick in the ADA requirement. The stage at, at Nordoff where we're changing does, and we're creating a ramp in the back, which actually worked out really well for uh, uh, the stage production because now they're going to have a, a, about a seven foot wide ramp with two double doors in the back where they can bring in stage and props and everything else without crawling through that maze that they had before or coming out in the front and such. So it's going to be quite a bit more workable. Um, stage projects and that that was because of the ADA requirement of uh, you know getting up to the stage level okay. for for all persons uh topa topa kitchen remodel uh we just went to the last thursday uh i finally submitted to environmental health which is our plan check fee for the county for uh for uh plan checking the requirements they have for uh for the kitchen so hopefully that's going to get started here uh again at the uh, end of school, beginning of summer, and get that project going. A lot of that stuff will be done by a person in-house with smaller uh, smaller contractors. That I will be just acting as a general contractor and bring in different subs to uh, produce that, and we can get a lot more uh, uh, done. And it's basically a phase one where we're looking at the future of possibly adding uh, the dishwasher back in and um, a walk-in refrigerator, depending on uh, the need for a better uh, uh, cafeteria use and stuff for the kids and such. Um, and we do have, I am putting um, plumbing in place for that future stuff now so we don't have to <coughs> tear up the floor and redo everything again later on to add the new stuff. So I'm kind of kind of uh, planning ahead a little bit on that. To, and there wasn't enough cost there to uh, be an issue. And then we're getting to the Miners Oaks uh, Roof restoration. We will be doing K1, which is, uh, I think it's building B, but they call it K1. Um, building G and the uh, restroom associated with it. There's a picture on the, uh, I think, yeah, uh, do you have this here, Bill? No. No. Yeah. Picture on that. Uh, looks a lot better in color when it didn't get black and white printed. But if you hold it, I don't know if you can see right here, this is the kindergarten room and then this wing here, and then the associated uh, corridors for that have been leaking terribly, which is why I chose this one over uh, one at Marimani because the corridors and electrical and stuff has been just pouring down through that. So it's causing a lot more damage uh, that way than, than were the others. And there's an associated restroom building H on the back, back in there. That's all going to get uh, re-roofed. It's going to be a restoration. And uh, basically what a roofing restoration is, Depending on the uh, viability of the, the fibers underneath, uh, most of your roofing products are uh, asphaltic. Back then, this was an asphaltic uh, emulsion, if you will, pressed into uh, the fibers, like fiberglass fibers. Some, some had asbestos, this did not. Um, uh, anyway, they, that, that creates your waterproofing and the tar putting on that and everything like that. What they're doing is they're going to take off all the rocks, which is their uh, UV uh, sunlight damage protection. They take all the uh, rocks they have there off, recycle them, and then they'll uh, repair the flashing, everything else, the counter flashing, all the, uh, the uh, leak producing items. And then they will put on a, a liquid emulsion, which is a, this new polymer. Uh, products that have come out probably in the last maybe 10 years have been really developed. Um, they use them, they, uh, they, it turns into a solid sheet hmm. and it, uh, it becomes uh, uh, the new waterproofing portion of it and it binds with the substrate underneath. We had it tested, I cored it for several different places where they, uh, they found that the, the substrate underneath and the body of the stuff, the, uh, the roofing was still good, it was just the uh, waterproofing had finally just evaporated out over time. So anyway, and um, the, the, the nice part about this project is it can be done quicker and um, there's a 10-year warranty on it and it's uh, approximately a third of the cost of 
tearing off and then re-roofing. Even with the uh, the uh, PVC vinyl uh, roofings they have, they're they're less expensive than the hot mob or the uh, built-up roofing. But uh, in this particular place, it wasn't a candidate for it because they have so much conduit up there trying to go up and around, and, and you cannot move the conduit because it's already connected. Um, so the uh, logistics of it uh, would have really driven the cost up trying to come up with a full tear off. And this gives us another 10 years, probably more if we maintain the roofs, i.e. keep the, uh, the uh, tree leaves, et cetera, et cetera, that's really detrimental to roofs off of it. And we'll probably get a good 15, 20 years out of this. And uh, again, we're saving uh, you know 60% over uh, tearing up, which means we could do more roofs 2018. I'm going to finish the rest of this, those, those three quarters off. So the two more uh, wings in 2018, and then we're going to go into uh, same in 2018 into uh, Air Monte, and then Toby Toby from there. So we're just kind of rolling through all the uh, prioritized roofing. Andy, and did you say that we're doing more than we anticipated doing it? I mean, more more roofs at Miners Oak. So we know the entire campus requires it. What we brought to you in April was only contemplating, going back to that picture, the K-1 building, mm -hmm. the kindergarten room, and then the that one wing of classrooms. But if you can see again, unfortunately, color didn't appear, uh, or in black and white doesn't appear as clear. But there is actually shading, for instance, connecting the K-1 building to the G. That overhang is also going to be done, as well as the back side where the bathroom is. Uh, where it's identified as that uh, HRR uh, building. Okay. So there are we. What we're able to do, you know, one of the goals that, you know, if you have a project that stays below one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars, there's different requirements as far as going out to advertise. Like at our uh, Nordoff Gym project, you'll see the advertisement in the VC Star, and uh, you know we are required to go through a different bid process. If you stay below 175, you don't have the same, uh, you know, number of hurdles which delay the onset of a project or the selection of a firm, at least. So we were wanting to make sure this project stayed within those parameters. Um, and as Ron contained his work and really identified, you know, the prospective contractors, they realized that we could actually look at a little bit larger space and still meet that, you know, that dollar threshold. Okay. I, w I would like to give my speech again about. Uh, wanting to know by doing more of this work mm -hmm. that's we're making a decision not to do other things and so I think it would be really important for the board to know what is the whole plan and we're making all these decisions along the way which are going to foreclose options later on and I think we ought to be able to participate in that discussion um, rather than I, I mean you know I'll always go back to the pool, but it's not just the pool. I'll just use it as an example. But if we were going to do five roofs and we do ten roofs instead of the five, that means we don't have money for a pool uh, or for something else. And so I, I really would like to see a, a longer-term plan of where we're allocating the money and what decisions we're making now that are going to I, you know, eliminate options that we would have otherwise had. Yeah. And in choosing these roofs, it was because the potential for damage far outweighed uh, a new pool, i.e., you know, we lose our gym structure, et cetera, et cetera. Same as the uh, structures for Miner's Oaks that I chose now, because the water infiltration as it's coming in now is damaging, and the potential for damage is going to escalate. And, uh, and possibly cause the school or the building to not be usable. Right. And I would probably 100% agree with every decision you're making. Mm -hmm. I just think these are decisions the board should make. Okay. You know. Fair enough. Well, yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll repeat just what the, I actually <laughs> understand where you're coming from, and I um, certainly see that as a priority that Ron and I are going to be working on over the coming months. I don't want us to. Um, delay though any action until we have that entire plan and so the things that we focus on really are as, as Ron said preservation of building when we know that there have been you know significant issues of you know students are being 
uh, you know, rain is leaking and dripping onto students in these classrooms during, you know, rain events. Right. It's or, really, the other point there is we had talked before when we were talking about closing schools. Well, maybe we don't close the school, but maybe we don't need these three buildings at the school. Mm -hmm. And we were going to do an analysis of what buildings we definitely needed and definitely didn't. We still haven't seen that. I think they are, from what I have heard, choosing those desperately, no matter what we're doing these. But I think down the road, you're right. That right, and, and it, that's exactly correct. And like the Topa Kitchen, we've been told by the health department, if we don't make these upgrades, that it's going to be shut down as a kitchen. So again, the, the things that we're really prioritizing for this summer are things that we didn't feel we could delay, and they were things that would absolutely be included in that bigger bigger scope plan, but I, I certainly hear anything. I, and, and I would, like I said, I would probably 100% support every one of these decisions. But when I hear, well, we weren't going to do this, but we decided to do it, then it just raises all kinds of red flags with me. You know, well, why weren't we going to do it? So do we need to do it? I'm sorry, what was the, did you think that's what I was saying with the Myers Oaks roof? With some of the additional buildings of Myers Oaks. So our, and I apologize, that's not what I was intending to convey. We absolutely know that it needs to be done. We were concerned the bids were going to be coming in higher and not be able to meet the, the threshold cap. for this current Got year. It. As Ron began to actually walk it with the uh, you know, potential contractors and they began to really you know, do that destructive testing to the roof, those core samplings, we were able to identify that we did have that ability to right. expand the scope and to a greater area budget. that we absolutely yeah. need to do while staying yeah, under yeah, budget. The whole idea was to stay with underneath that 175,000 sure. cap, which, which really saves us a ton of time. See, I would have been 100%. <laughs> I told you. Yeah. So, I mean, cost savings is paramount in my mind as far as what we're doing, and it's you got to weigh the necessity versus that. But if you guys want to have a... a, a dialogue on a um, plan that we want to do, I'd be more happy. Yeah, to no, I, I really feel strongly that we need to have a plan. Okay. Yeah. Because the community is going to come to us and say, sure. why did you do this? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be in a position of saying, well, it just happened. Mm -hmm. You know, and we didn't really decide. Sure. It just happened. Well, in, in fairness, I think I think we had kind of come to, if not a formal, in my view at least, a kind of informal understanding that certain kind of triage work was not going to require board approval. And, and I think in some of our meetings on the subject of Measure J, we even talked about you know not wanting to micromanage to the point of, of being, um, of not getting anything done. Right. Um, but, but that said, I, I would also, well, one, one, I want to say, it sounds like you're being really resourceful. And, and that's what I think we all hoped for when we hired you, and so thank you. Um, you know, I, I love music to my ears when I hear like, you know, instead of tearing the thing off, we realized did some testing, 10 years, maybe even more, love it, you know? Steel, 50 years, great. Um, <clears throat> and as much to you as anyone, Andy, I, I, I mentioned it many times, I think, probably third time now, I would love in our, in our um, board, every board meeting, I just love an update on Measure J. I just want, the financial, every time, here's where we are, here's how much money we have in the bank, here's how much we spent, here's where it was spent. Anything uh, that we know, even if it's not paid yet, you know, just the most transparent, you know, and I don't think it's make work, right, because it's, it's information we have, right? I mean, I, I, maybe we can have a dialogue if, if it's gonna be make work, but sure. to the extent that it's information we have and it just needs to be printed up, you know, just we very helpful. My only other question is how much engagement now, I'm talking to you and I'm hearing that great um, phrase acting as my own uh, uh, contractor. contractor, I love that. Um, how much are we doing with Balfour Beatty these days? Very little. Great. Um, so yeah, our goal is really, you know, Ron is taking lead on all these projects. Each of the ones that are identified here, I can't actually think, of, there's nothing on this list that they've been involved in. This particular list? Right. No. Yeah, so nothing that we've discussed here today has actually had any involvement from Balfour Beatty. Let me make sure I understand. Um, this, because we can rehab instead of replace, you're able to do the additional roofing with the same budgeted dollar amount, is that correct? Well, no, so we, we actually moved off the concept of replacement at Myers Oaks, well, when you did the destructive testing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a few months ago, because a replacement was going to cost at least 3x. It was going to be three times greater. So we were looking at a $500,000 project 
as opposed to a, a 150 for the same area. So we, we moved off of that once Ron was able to come up with the terrific cost savings of being able to identify this as a great restoration candidate rather than replacement. But once we were looking at restoration, we knew that we need to, again, do all of these roofs. We, uh, they're permanent structures. They're actively used as classrooms. They are currently both leaking on the people within the, the rooms as well as causing or damage to the structures. Um, and so what we really were trying to do within the past month was figure out what's the most that we could accomplish this summer while still being within the legal parameters of the bid process that we were going through. So, but my question was, how much does this exceed the original budget? Budget for? for roofing at minor zones. So, uh, we the, had a, we had the number you received, something. the number you received two weeks ago was 110 and this is 150. So the increase is 40,000, but it's not an apples to apples increase because we're talking about more more space actually being done. You know, more Right, more no, I understand to, that, but to, to I, I actually... Are you talking about between Belfort and Beatty? Let me get it out. I don't disagree, um, I mean, I don't disagree with Faith that, you know, when dollars are recovered, that this board really needs to be involved in making priority decisions. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that this was within the existing budget, to me it's a wash, right? If you find a more effective way of getting something accomplished, for the same money, which means we can get more done for the same money, good on you, right? Um, so that's what I was trying to figure out, is what's the delta here from the initial replacement budget to this expanded rehab budget, so it's 40, 50 grand is the difference. Well, the initial replacement budget was, like I said, closer to $500,000. So the entire project is coming in at a 65% cost savings from what we originally were anticipating. Right. So we're talking about a, you know, a very significant cost savings from what we originally were anticipating this these roots needing. Okay, good, thank you. Based on what Balfour Bay had. Correct. <laughs> right. okay. Other questions? Do you have an action to approve the, <coughs> the project? And just to approve awarding the contract for the minor soaps. Oh, okay. So we have our three um, bids, and we have to take the cheapest one. Isn't that correct? The lowest responsible bidder. So it looks like we are asking uh, Cal Pacific Roof. Oh, best <laughs> contracting services. Count the um, other budget factor there. <laughs> so we're asked to approve a contract for the roofing project at Miners Oaks with best contracting services. Correct. I'll move. I'll second. Oh, go ahead. It's all you. <laughs> after after I was so <laughs> negative, I think it's my duty to second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Thank you. Very, Thank very much. Good job. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on board. Yeah, no. Thank you. Okay, 7.5.2. Board discussion and consideration of potential upcoming meeting schedule regarding the potential lease of the district office. Oh, uh, so what we had talked about, um, or what we want to talk about, is um, the 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 property as a whole or in parts. And, um, you know, Thane way back began talking about the dirt over here versus the building over here. So um, what, we, what we would like to propose, or what I would like to propose, is finding a date that we, right? A date where we could open, it's a town hall walk of the property to show what are our different pieces and then to come back and actually sit and have a meeting about try to get the community's input on what they would like to I see. I would love here. to hear that. Right? Yeah, I'm just, uh, I was just wondering if we could get Nordoff PE credit <laughs> <laughs> for the walk. Not enough. Um, I guess the question would be what, you know, before the school year ends? Yeah. Again, we Before just remind. Families are gone. Right, I think so, and <clears throat> we have this long period of time, more than a month. Right. Well, I mean, sometimes it happens, but a month plus four days before our next meeting. So yeah, I was hoping that if you can't find a date sitting around here right now, ask Kathy uh, to go out and look for some options, yeah. and sometime uh, before Memorial Day, right? mm -hmm. so th third week or so maybe of May, uh, to find a couple of hours. We can do that. We can advertise it as significantly, significantly as we can, 
and hopefully get people uh, from across the community who are interested in getting a better visual sense of what we have. So I guess my question would be, um, you know, I always think about, well, if you, you, it'd be nice to see the property if you have an idea that's not going to fit on the property, right? But there might be people who don't walk who are still going to come and participate. Oh, sure. Oh, no. But it, I would, we would like to encourage. Right. To, to be a two-party. If you're going to speak, <coughs> it'd walk. be nice if walk you did first, walk, talk too, you know? Yeah. So, um, so two-party meeting, though. Yes. Two meeting. And obviously, you want to do it. Well, it's light late, late, so there's right. not really a problem. So that's what we talked about, and uh, I, when I've run that past some few pe few people, they, as Mike said, really think it's a good idea. So uh, I mean, you can try to find a date if you want, but Kathy's really good at yeah, identifying just, that. Uh, just, maybe the maybe the best, most important thing is um, you know, what what hours hours mm -hmm. space are you thinking about? So uh, three hours or so. Hour, hour and a half walk, hour and a half talk, Ooh, something like that. Hour and a half to walk to I walk. don't think so. Well, or whatever. Okay. Right. I, I would, I would need no doubt to give you credit. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to walk for an hour and a half, but this is a wrap. You know, you'll you could talk. do six to eight thirty. We could walk for forty minutes, okay. start right. the meeting. At, if you walk at six o'clock, mm -hmm. you know, and then from six forty-five to. Is it impractical to do it on a weekend? Like you know, people work. I mean, if we want people to be here, Ooh, time Saturday. to walk and all of that. Saturday. It'd be that's, a that's fun tight. Saturday. That would be a great thing. Sure. Well, you, you, Afterwards, you can send your kids. You to want to add that to the mix, Kathy? And, you know, when sure. You and what about what hours on Saturday? Then? You don't. You don't want six to eight thirty on Saturday. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't thinking, I guess it's, if it's going to be hot, we might want to start at ten thirty in the morning. Well, that's a good point. You know, maybe nine to eleven thirty. <laughs> nine to eleven thirty. Nine thirty. <laughs> okay. Nine thirty to <laughs> sleep in. Yes. Nine thirty to noon. Yeah. Thirty to noon. Okay. Yeah. So we're looking at like the twentieth. <coughs> so we'll, we'll that put that on the list here. Um, now, is this? How does this? Um, how do we interact with the city council on that? Is this? Is well, I, I invited, I, but it, oh, absolutely. Not. I have fact, uh, I did have my conversation today with Steve McClary, and I'll be reporting that to you. But basically. Uh, I just informed him that we're going to be looking for some, two things. One, some more information from the city, uh, having expressed interest in uh, interacting with us, and I gave him some thoughts about uh, what we might be interested in hearing from them, and he told me what he, they might be interested in hearing from us after we, if they hear from us, or that kind of back and forth. So you'll see all that laid out in paper, on paper. Nothing, you know, of, of anything unusual but just interacting to get more information for each party from each party okay so i i picture this it's not a joint meeting no. they're welcome to attend and exactly. listen right exactly but it's, and if, it's right <coughs> if, any, if any one or more of you know if it's a public meeting uh, i don't know what their rules are so i won't let's let's say three of them come if they want if they have to call it as a special meeting <coughs> let them do it okay but it's our meeting so I sort of don't think they have to, but maybe they would. Yeah, want they can to, attend. They would sure. They would want to be. They want to be conservative. They could call it. <coughs> bless you. Their special meeting. But anyway, so uh, you could either try to find uh, 9:30 to noon now on an upcoming Saturday. Or well, we should probably I think look into city May events. 20th yeah. is uh, your, May 20th and June 3rd are really your only choices. The other uh, is Memorial Day weekend. You don't okay. want to go with that. Well, okay. May 20th. Okay. Well, that's what I'm saying. It, it has always happened. Right. You know, so yeah. maybe we could take a look. Mike's idea, I like the idea. I like Saturday. You know, if we can pull it off, <coughs> maybe that would be a first oh, option. Second second option would be in that uh, you know, 6 to 830. Those 6 to 830. Mm -hmm. So if you want to check on that, and then sure. we'll make Give sure. Give several options. Yeah, that'd mm -hmm. be great. Okay. So that's the action, if you would. Make a motion to, uh, you don't have to, you don't have to. It doesn't even have to be official action. We know which right. one. Okay. Future item for future meeting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, 7.5.3, Prop 39. <coughs> I'll be brief on this one. So we've talked a lot about our Prop 39 dollars. In fact, just did it last week as well. Um, it is money that's allocated for energy efficiency improvements. The first step in the process to be able to utilize these funds are to actually do the planning stage of having an audit and then submitting or identifying projects and submitting that plan to the state. 
Um, this we did an RFP a, a few weeks ago and had four respondents. This is the firm that Ron and I both feel uh, we can best utilize to leverage both our Prop 39 and other funding sources. Uh, one of the most appealing uh, aspects of this firm is they don't charge to actually do the audit, whereas the other response uh, charged actually quite considerably, about forty to $50,000. Um, where this firm tries to make their money is based on the uh, identification of potential projects and their oversight of those projects. But that's something that we would certainly bring to the board as we develop that plan, uh, to what extent they'll be involved in which projects. So, so this is just the audit. So this is just actually, yeah, at this point, all we're asking for is to be able to engage them to perform the audit and create the plan that would then be coming back to you for approval then going up to the state. Um, so at this time, we're only committing to them for the purposes of the uh, of the first first stage of what will be you know multi stage project for Prop Thirty Nine. Well, I would move to approve that. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. Oh, Seven point five. Take advantage of you. you know, those three breaks. <laughs> <laughs> it always it always results in you yeah. needing new breaks. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but the Prop 39 money will pay for it. Right? I mean, they're not going to have to. Wow. 7.5.4, follow-up report from the three budget study sessions. So Andy and I had a brief conversation about this, um, I think, for the board and the, the group that is here. There doesn't need to be a follow-up, but basically um, what we kind of concluded was that although we don't know uh, that those three meetings will say, wow, when Andy comes out with a budget in June, he's going to change eight things. We do feel that it gave us a path to a future budgets that we, it, where we're going to be looking for <coughs> places to save money. Is there any other thoughts that you all came out of those? Well, I think it was really important that we had the conversation. I think any time that we can, uh, most people have no understanding of how school budgets work, and to be able to make that public, to allow people to listen in on that conversation, uh, for us to hear it, I think is a very useful thing. So. I agree. You know, people always think there are hidden pots of gold in places, and you know, if you just dig in the right spot, you solve all the problems. And, Unfortunately, in these environments where our, we don't we don't we don't control our revenue, it, it, it more or less controls us. Uh, I agree. It's important that the public understand um, how restricted the budget is. They understand, um, you know, how small we really are, and there are a lot of fixed costs that, that hit us disproportionately because we're so small. Um, so it's important to understand that. But by the same token, I think that the board has communicated that we want to push the envelope. Uh, we want to always look at stuff and see is there a different way. The way we've always done it is not good enough anymore, right? Because it's a new world and, and so I think that's really good. Um, it's really hard. You know, it's, uh, it's not that simple. Uh, and I think it's important that people understand that. But unfortunately, I didn't come away with any blinding um, silver bullets. I was really Who hoping. knew it would be so difficult? <laughs> <laughs> This is hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Anyone over there? Um, glad we did it. I, you know, concur. I, I, I've got some ideas on the on the revenue side. I still am intrigued by the idea of something involving, uh, you know, internet and recapturing ADA for students that miss school. I think that's a, possibly an opportunity. I don't know if there's a legal problem with it, but you know, it, it's it's much more attractive to me the idea of. Um, somehow making up a lost school day online rather than attending a, a school on Saturday, which mm -hmm. seems like such a drag. Um, so, you know, some, something to consider. Uh, con I'm going to continue, continue to look at it and research it. Great. Um, I just have to say that I'm very grateful that I don't feel like I was involved in getting this ball rolling, but boy, it hit me at the right time because <laughs> I join the board and then it's all explained. <laughs> I get this intro. So I'm very grateful for all the groundwork you guys did on that. There'll be a test. <laughs> <laughs>
Andy or Hank? And, and, and no, you, you, you uh, as far as I'm concerned, you hit the nail on the head with the 2018-19 and thereafter. I think you have some real opportunities. Uh, and there'll be, as Andy keeps reminding me, uh, as he looks at the projections for revenues and expenditures, uh, uh, some challenges. And we'll be hearing from the governor in May, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Is... Have you heard anything about the revise? I, mean, I haven't heard anything. I've heard just, again, some rumors circling within some of the consulting firms that are based up there saying they are definitely anticipating an increase in one-time funding, but not anywhere nearly increase that we've seen in some of the recent years. So right now we have uh, approximately $200,000, I believe, budgeted. Last year it was 600. The year prior it was about 1.4. So they said don't expect even 600, but you can be confident it's going to move off the two. So that's, that's what they're hearing within their circles over at the Assembly and Senate, but I don't know how much of a direct line they have to, to Brown and the DOF. 7.5.5, approval of a 16, 17 school year salary for a superintendent. So there is, um, this is a little different. We were gonna just, for the audience, but we don't have an audience, so. Um, well, wait a minute. Yeah. Well, I mean, you guys are us, you know. Uh, so the, the, for the audience, there is a, a giant mirror. Yeah. <laughs> there is a, a a slight difference in the way it's happening this year versus the way it happened in the past. In the past, all this conversation would take place in closed session concerning the salary, but um, apparently there are some districts that don't operate the same way as we do, um, and that they would sometimes hide the costs associated with having a superintendent. So there's a new legislative action that we have to have this discussion in public about how much we would um, we plan to offer or to give a raise to our superintendent. And um, one of the things that we discussed in closed session, obviously, is his performance. And he'll, he'll get a, um, a file of all our, our thoughts in private. Um, but, but the quality of the work that Hank has done for us and since, since the last time we reviewed him, it was almost two years ago. Yeah, year and a half? No, year and a half. close to two years, yeah. Year and a half. Um, has not, unfortunately, been reflected in raises because of our, our situation. And he's taken furlough days, and um, he's helped us through a lot of things. So um, our, um, I think it's all our opinions that the reflection of the, sal of the salary enhancement would be based on um, what we could afford, what we, how we feel about his performance, and um, let's see if I have another note. And of course it will have to reflect the things that the state requires and we show his salary and his benefits. So is there any, um, I don't know if we want to have a discussion or if someone would like to um, make a recommendation that can start Well, so motions. maybe Andy can help. Salary and benefits, are that, that the current salary and benefits needs to be announced and then we just go from there in terms of. No, so what we need to have formally recognized by the board and part of the vote and then we'll appear in the minutes are the uh, approved new amount. Right. But if it's helpful, I, think, I can identify. Yeah, I think we should just identify okay. the current amount, and then from there we can. Sure. Logically. So, so his the current budget for sixteen seventeen is one hundred seventy four thousand two fifty. Uh, the statutory benefits for sixteen seventeen, which include STRS, um, work comp, um, Medicare, and unemployment, is twenty eight thousand nine. $192. And the uh, benefit piece, uh, he does not receive medical benefits. He does receive dental and then a uh, um, $30,000 life policy, just as all employees receive. Um, the value of that is $699 in the, the current 16 17 school year. And that's not the highest in our county. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Correct. 
Yeah, where does, do you, do you have that information or generally, where does that put him in the county? Places him as the second lowest paid um, principal or a superintendent who does not share a principal superintendent responsibility. The lowest paid is the principal at uh, Mupu. Um, did I say? Sorry. Superintendent Mupu, the single school site, but as far as uh, uh, multi school sites, uh, it's the lowest, he's the lowest compensated superintendent in the county. And Hank started in 2007? Uh, 2009, 2009, 10. 2009, 2009 August 9th. It's, 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 it's gone so fast. Um, and then, and then during that time, um, there were budget cuts, above budget um, issues that gave rise to him, along with staff and teachers, foregoing some of his contracted salary. Correct. Correct. Is there like a total for how much he's? he's uh, it's about forty-five thousand. Yeah. Right, so uh, I'm trying to do this through leading questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I so we can so uh, Hank I did. I think a courtroom would be a lot better. <laughs> Everyone's like, What's, "What an idiot!" It's right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> and people shouted out answers in the courtroom. I'm like, done this. I'm trying to make the record as necessary. Okay. Um, so yes, yes, indeed. Uh, um, you know, all of our staff took further days. Superintendent did take the lead and take the, the greatest number above both administrators and the unions. The amount actually uh, adds up to in excess of $50,000 reduced during the um, six year period of the contract where there were furlough days. And he could have enforced his contract, presumably, because he had one that would have allowed him to get his full payment. That's correct. So if I'm reading this chart correctly, from 2009 to 2017, in all but two years, the superintendent was paid significantly less than his contract amount. That That's correct? correct. Well, if you put it that way, I'm feeling uh, <laughs> bad about my really my good. suggestion of. Uh, <laughs> well. Thank you. Um, if. if we can certainly have continued discussion, but I, I thought I'd make a motion to, um, you know, at least match what we have been doing for our our, our staff and and offer a four percent or recommend a four percent. Just to be clear, that would be four percent, which is consistent with OFT, the teachers as well as the administrators. Yeah, beginning be of on January, schedule. on schedule. And that's some slightly different than CSEA, which is two and a half percent on schedule, one and a half percent off schedule. All right, so my suggestion is 4% on uh, beginning January 1st. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 None opposed. So just for the record, the new salary amount with the 4% on schedule is 177000 735. The new statutory amount is 29,572. Uh, the dental benefits do not change at the 699 amount. And so the total uh, cost of the uh, superintendent's contract with statutory and uh, all other uh, benefits and compensation included is 208,000 and six dollars. Thank you. That's what we approve. Okay. Next, 7.5.6, superintendent's report. That's a good segue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, a couple things. First of all, uh, 30 seconds worth of reflection on 7.5.5, I appreciate where you arrived and, and how you how you got there, except uh, in the conversation, it brought back all those bad memories. <laughs> <laughs> but when I look at Angie and Chuck, you know, what can I say, man? We were all in it together, right? We all suffered together. Oh, and Teresa, I'm sorry. I forgot just <laughs> And Patty, you too. Anyway, so, <laughs> so yeah, thank you. So actually, it's really cool. We had administrator and classified and, uh, and certificated leadership, which is, uh, really what those years were all about. And so I was, I won't say I was pleased to do it, but it was absolutely the right thing to do. And uh, 
uh, it was it was important in a lot of ways uh, to have those um, all of the administrators and I step up a little beyond uh, the unions because we're compensated better and we have more work days. So that's what I was thinking as you were talking. Uh, moving forward, you know what I've been trying to do here now in the last three to four months in particular is to think about uh, how we spend some time during this board meeting and what the key issue was and then what that portends for the future, right? So I've done that and I'm going to keep doing that as long as there's an issue or two on the agenda that qualifies. Uh, today for sure there is and so I just want to give you a very short monologue. You know, I always have this rule that uh, the length of my superintendent's report is directly related to the time of the evening. So for those of you who are wondering what time it is, it's uh, 8.43. Um, but I do want to say this, I, and, and as I look at uh, the evolution of the district from even going back to 1997 when there were 4,200 students, <clears throat> when I came a little bit over 3,000, we mentioned before, remember we were talking about the counselors, right, the counselor ratio. So Nordhoff was a bit over 900 when I came, now it's under 700. I think the biggest challenge facing this district <clears throat> in the upcoming years, uh, even if Nordhoff doesn't get much smaller, and it will get smaller, okay, let's call it, depending on, separate Chaparral, call it 675. <clears throat> if, it, if it moves on down to 625, 650, what Greg was getting at tonight I think is just absolutely crucial, and that is I would suggest that there be sort of a high school colloquium right, where people who are interested in talking about what the program will be for the classes of 2017-18, uh, freshmen of 2017-18, on through freshmen of 2020-21-22, and therefore the four years beyond that when they finish, what are some options for that program? because you know the, the whole sort of the, the party line in the years I've been here and I agree with it is that we were trying to we were trying to keep a large school well medium-sized school program in a small school mm -hmm. and I think generally we've done that but as you heard Greg say if you if you have an effort effort to retain courses and you have 20 percent less students and you have 20 percent less staff by definition, when that master schedule is created, you're going to have more singletons or doubletons. And therefore, it's harder to, to get access unless you do some of the things we've talked about, right? So uh, my thinking uh, after tonight is you have some just eminently qualified people. You, you know, I don't know if she's even 30, but let's say Natalie, she's young. Uh, you know, head of the science department. Uh, she's, the, she's part of the future of this district. Believe me, it took every every possible way of convincing her to not go do that doctoral program full time. And Greg knows a lot about UCSB, as you know. So uh, thank God she decided to work with us 80% and start her doctoral program uh, in a little bit of a more deliberate fashion. So you see the kind of leadership that's emerged over the last uh, 10, well, in Greg's case, eight years. Dave's actually a little more than that. So we'll call it 10 years, new leadership, I think you have all the intellect that you could you could need, but intellect itself will not solve the problem. Right? You're going to have to really take a look at, you know, what are the courses available, what are the number of teaching sections we have, and what are some changes that we need to make, which we're now making in terms of mathematics and science, and what kind of elective program do we want to have? Right? All those things, because in the elementary schools, while there's a huge amount of new work that will unfold with Common Core. The fact is that it's still relatively easy to, to, to define staffing. Right? You take the number of kids, you have a divisor, that's how many classes you have, X number of, X number of discrete classes, X number of, of uh, two grade classes, combination classes. It's not that complicated. Same in the junior high. The, the program is fairly well defined. The, the wheel changes a bit, but the program is pretty well defined. Okay, there are not that many choices. But at the high school, I'm telling you that there's a huge difference among 650, 950, and 1250 in terms of students. Okay? And Nordhoff was 1250 plus, right? It was 1250 plus. And the, 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 the mean over the last 20 years or so is about 950. Now we're at the bottom of the curve. So you have the right people in place, you know, with your participation and trusting the staff, 
but asking tough questions. I think that's the biggest challenge for this district in the years ahead, is the high school program and how it's going to be delivered and what, what can be retained or not. Okay, so those are my thoughts tonight. Hmm. Items for future agendas. <clears throat> Anyone? Okay. Consent calendar. Obviously a lot of things going on in the district. Wonderful. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? I'll move to approve. I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So can I None get on this first council tour? <laughs> <laughs> None opposed. We do not need to reconvene in our closed session. So um, that is our evening. Thank you, everyone.